The 101 Zen Stories video series offers a treasure trove of wisdom, encapsulating the essence of Zen Buddhism in accessible bite-sized stories. Perfect for anyone seeking peace in a bustling lifestyle, it promotes mindfulness, enhances self-awareness, and fosters a deeper connection with the present moment. A guide to tranquility and personal growth, these stories illuminate the path to a more serene and focused life. 1. Learning to be silent. The pupils of the Tendai school used to study meditation before Zen entered Japan. Four of them who were intimate friends promised one another to observe seven days of silence. On the first day, all were silent. Their meditation had begun auspiciously. But when night came and the oil lamps were growing dim, one of the pupils could not help exclaiming to a servant, Fix those lamps. The second pupils was surprised to hear the first one talk. We are not supposed to say a word, he remarked. You two are stupid. Why did you talk? asked the third. I am the only one who has not talked, concluded the fourth pupil. Circumflex. In a world inundated with noise and distractions, this story from the Tendai School highlights the challenge of true silence and mindfulness. It reveals how easily intentions can be undermined by habitual reactions, emphasizing the importance of awareness and discipline in modern life. Amidst the constant bombardment of information and stimuli, practicing mindfulness is crucial for maintaining focus, cultivating inner peace, and enhancing self-awareness. This tale underscores the value of mindfulness in navigating the complexities of contemporary existence, encouraging individuals to foster a deeper connection with themselves and their surroundings through deliberate silence and reflection. 2. Finding a Diamond on a Muddy Road Gudo was the emperor's teacher of his time. Nevertheless, he used to travel alone as a wandering mendicant. Once when he was on his wars to Edo, the cultural and political center of the shogunate, he approached a little village named Takenaka. It was evening and a heavy rain was falling. Gudo was thoroughly wet. His straw sandals were in pieces. At a farmhouse near the village, he noticed four or five pairs of sandals in the window and decided to buy some dry ones. The woman who offered him the sandals, seeing how wet he was, invited him in to remain for the night at her home. Gudo accepted, thanking her. He entered and recited a sutra before the family shrine. He then was introduced to the woman's mother and to her children. Observing that the entire family was depressed, Gudo asked what was wrong. My husband is a gambler and a drunkard, the housewife told him. When he happens to win, he drinks and becomes abusive. When he loses, he borrows money from others. Sometimes when he becomes thoroughly drunk, he does not come home at all. What can I do? I will help him, said Gudo. Here is some money. Get me a gallon of fine wine and something good to eat. Then you may retire. I will meditate before the shrine. When the man of the house returned about midnight, quite drunk, he bellowed, Hey wife, I am home. Have you something for me to eat? I have something for you, said Gudo. I happened to get caught in the rain, and your wife kindly asked me to remain here for the night. In return, I have bought some wine and fish, so you might as well have them. The man was delighted. He drank the wine at once and laid himself down on the floor. Gudo sat in meditation beside him. In the morning when the husband awoke, he had forgotten about the previous night. Who are you? Where do you come from? he asked Gudo who still was meditating. I am Gudo of Kyoto, and I am going on to Edo, replied the Zen master. The man was utterly ashamed. He apologized profusely to the teacher of his emperor. Gudo smiled. Everything in this life is impermanent, he explained. Life is very brief. If you keep on gambling and drinking, you will have no time left to accomplish anything else and you will cause your family to suffer too. The perception of the husband awoke as if from a dream. You are right, he declared. 
How can I ever repay you for this wonderful teaching? Let me see you off and carry your things a little way. If you wish, assented Gudo. The two started out. After they had gone three miles, Gudo told him to return. Just another five miles, he begged Gudo. They continued on. You may return now, suggested Gudo. After another ten miles, the man replied. Return now, said Gudo, when the ten miles had been passed. I am going to follow you all the rest of my life, declared the man. Modern Zen teachers in Japan spring from the lineage of a famous master who was the successor of Gudo. His name was Munan, the man who never turned back. In a world increasingly dominated by materialism and instant gratification, this story reminds us of the impermanence of life and the importance of mindfulness and compassion. Gudo's simple act of kindness and wisdom not only transformed a troubled household but also left a lasting legacy through his teachings. It illustrates that true change begins with understanding and empathy rather than judgment or force. This narrative encourages us to reflect on our actions and their impact on others, emphasizing that it's never too late to alter our path for the betterment of ourselves and those around us. Through mindfulness, we can navigate life's challenges with grace and leave a positive mark on the world just as Gudo did. 3. Is that so? The Zen Master. Hakuin was praised by his neighbors as one living a pure life. A beautiful Japanese girl whose parents owned a food store lived near him. Suddenly, without any warning, her parents discovered she was with child. This made her parents very angry. She would not confess who the man was, but after much harassment at last named Hakuin. In great anger, the parents went to the master. Is that so? was all he would say. After the child was born, it was brought to Hakuin. By this time, he had lost his reputation, which did not trouble him, but he took very good care of the child. He obtained milk from his neighbors and everything else the little one needed. A year later, the girl mother could stand it no longer. She told her parents the truth, that the real father of the child was a young man who worked in the fish market. The mother and father of the girl at once went to Hakuin to ask his forgiveness, to apologize at length, and to get the child back again. Hakuin was willing. In yielding the child, all he said was, Is that so? Circumflex. Embracing uncertainty with grace, Hakuin's story teaches modern life's resilience. Amidst false accusations, he remained untroubled, focusing on care over reputation. His response, Is that so? exemplifies detachment from ego and judgment, urging us to handle life's unpredictability with composure and open-heartedness. This mindset fosters peace and adaptability in today's fast-paced world, emphasizing character and integrity over societal validation. This tale imparts a vital lesson for the contemporary era advocating for the strength found in serenity and the importance of maintaining one's character in the face of unjust situations. It underscores the value of responding to life's challenges with a calm and open heart rather than with defensiveness or aggression. This approach not only helps in navigating personal turmoil but also in cultivating a more compassionate and understanding society. 4. Obedience The Master Bankei's talks were attended not only by Zen students, but by persons of all ranks and sects. He never quoted sutras, nor indulged in scholastic dissertations. Instead, his words were spoken directly from his heart to the hearts of his listeners. His large audiences angered a priest of the Nichiren sect because the adherents had left to hear about Zen. The self-centered Nichiren priest came to the temple, determined to debate with Bankei. Hey, Zen teacher, he called out. Wait a minute. Whoever respects you will obey what you say, but a man like myself does not respect you. Can you make me obey you? Come up beside me and I will show you, said Bankai. 
Proudly, the priest pushed his way through the crowd to the teacher. Benke smiled. Come over to my left side. The priest obeyed. No, said Benke. We may talk better if you are on the right side. Step over here. The priest proudly stepped over to the right. You see, observed Benke, you are obeying me, and I think you are a very gentle person. Now sit down and listen. Circumflex. Benke's approach to teaching, focusing on direct communication from heart to heart, underscores the power of authenticity and personal connection in conveying messages. In today's fast-paced digital world, where interactions are often superficial and mediated by screens, Benke's method reminds us of the importance of genuine human connection. The encounter with the Nietzschean priest highlights how ego and confrontation can dissolve in the face of humility and simplicity. This teaches modern individuals the value of openness, flexibility, and the ability to listen and engage with others beyond preconceptions or biases, fostering a more harmonious and understanding society. 5. If you love, love openly. Twenty monks and one nun who was named Eshun were practicing meditation with a certain Zen master. Eshun was very pretty even though her head was shaved and her dress plain. Several monks secretly fell in love with her. One of them wrote her a love letter insisting upon a private meeting. Eshun did not reply. The following day, the master gave a lecture to the group, and when it was over, Eshun arose. Addressing the one who had written her, she said, If you really love me so much, come and embrace me now. In a group of twenty monks and a nun named Eshun practicing Zen, Eshun's beauty attracted secret admirers despite her simple appearance. One monk's bold love letter prompted no direct response. Yet, after a lecture, Eshun publicly challenged him to prove his love, embodying transparency and confronting emotions directly. This story underscores the importance of honesty and courage in facing our feelings, especially in modern society where digital communication often replaces direct, meaningful interactions. It highlights the value of authenticity and personal integrity in navigating relationships, encouraging us to embrace vulnerability and express our true selves openly rather than hiding behind anonymity or societal expectations. 6. No loving, kindness. There was an old woman in China who had supported a monk for over 20 years. She had built a little hut for him and fed him while he was meditating. Finally, she wondered just what progress he had made in all this time. To find out, she obtained the help of a girl rich in desire. Go and embrace him, she told her, and then ask him suddenly, what now? The girl called upon the monk and without much ado caressed him, asking him what he was going to do about it. An old tree grows on a cold rock in winter, replied the monk somewhat poetically. Nowhere is there any warmth. The girl returned and related what he had said. To think I fed that fellow for twenty years, exclaimed the old woman in anger. He showed no consideration for your need, no disposition to explain your condition. He need not have responded to passion, but at least he could have evidenced some compassion. She at once went to the hut of the monk and burned it down. Circumflex. There was an old woman in China who had supported a monk for over twenty years. She had built a little hut for him and fed him while he was meditating. Finally, she wondered just what progress he had made in all this time. To find out, she obtained the help of a girl rich in desire. Go and embrace him, she told her, and then ask him suddenly, what now? The girl called upon the monk and without much ado caressed him, asking him what he was going to do about it. An old tree grows on a cold rock in winter, replied the monk somewhat poetically. Nowhere is there any warmth. The girl returned and related what he had said. 
To think I fed that fellow for twenty years, exclaimed the old woman in anger. He showed no consideration for your need, no disposition to explain your condition. He need not have responded to passion, but at least he could have evidenced some compassion. She at once went to the hut of the monk and burned it down. 7. Announcement Tanzan wrote sixty postal cards on the last day of his life and asked an attendant to mail them. Then he passed away. The cards read, I am departing from this world. This is my last announcement. Tanzan, July 27, 1892 Circumflex In a world saturated with digital noise, Tanzan's final act of writing postal cards underscores the profound value of personal, tangible communication. Even as he faced life's end, Tanzan chose a deeply personal way to say goodbye, reminding us in the modern age to cherish genuine connections. Amidst the ephemeral nature of social media and emails, his story encourages us to prioritize meaningful interactions that leave lasting impressions, teaching us that, in moments of farewell, the medium of our message can be as significant as the message itself. 8. Great Waves In the early days of the Meiji era, there lived a well-known wrestler called Onami, Great Waves, Onami was immensely strong and knew the art of resting. In his private bouts, he defeated even his teacher, but in public was so bashful that his own pupils threw him. Onami felt he should go to a Zen master for help. Hakuju, a wandering teacher, was stopping in a little temple nearby, so Onami went to see him and told him of his great trouble. Great waves is your name, the teacher advised. So stay in this temple tonight. Imagine that you are those billows. You are no longer a wrestler who is afraid. You are those huge waves sweeping everything before them, swallowing all in their path. Do this, and you will be the greatest wrestler in the land. The teacher retired. Onami sat in meditation, trying to imagine himself as waves. He thought of many different things. Then gradually he turned more and more to the feeling of waves. As the night advanced, the waves became larger and larger. They swept away the flowers in their vases. Even the Buddha in the shrine was inundated. Before dawn, the temple was nothing but the ebb and flow of an immense sea. In the morning, the teacher found Onami meditating, a faint smile on his face. He patted the wrestler's shoulder. Now nothing can disturb you he said. You are those waves. You will sweep everything before you. The same day, Onami entered the wrestling contests and won. After that, no one in Japan was able to defeat him. Circumflex. In this tale from the Meiji era, Onami, a skilled yet bashful wrestler, overcomes his fear through visualization, embodying his name, Great Waves, by imagining himself as powerful, unstoppable waves. This ancient story teaches modern lessons about the power of mindset and visualization in overcoming personal barriers. By adopting a mental image that embodies strength and confidence, one can transform internal fears into triumphs. It underscores the importance of self-belief and the mental aspect of challenges, a principle highly relevant in today's world where psychological barriers often impede potential. 9. The moon cannot be stolen. Ryokin, a Zen master, lived the simplest kind of life in a little hut at the foot of a mountain. One evening, a thief visited the hut only to discover there was nothing in it to steal. Ryokin returned and caught him. You may have come a long way to visit me, he told the prowler and you should not return empty-handed. Please take my clothes as a gift. The thief was bewildered. He took the clothes and slunk away. Ryokin sat naked, watching the moon. Poor fellow, he mused. I wish I could give him this beautiful moon. Circumflex. Ryokin's tale, a Zen master who offered his clothes to a thief, 
embodies profound life lessons. In our materialistic world, it urges simplicity, generosity, and finding joy in non-material wealth. It highlights the insignificance of possessions compared to the beauty of nature and the human spirit. Ryokin's wish to share the moon symbolizes the ultimate gift, sharing what truly enriches our lives, which can't be stolen or bought. This story encourages us to reconsider our values, fostering a life of contentment and appreciation for the intangible wonders surrounding us. 10. The Last Poem of Hoshin The Zen master Hoshin lived in China many years. Then he returned to the northeastern part of Japan where he taught his disciples. When he was getting very old, he told them a story he had heard in China. This is the story. One year on the 25th of December, Tokufu, who was very old, said to his disciples, I am not going to be alive next year, so you fellows should treat me well this year. The pupils thought he was joking, but since he was a great-hearted teacher, each of them in turn treated him to a feast on succeeding days of the departing year. On the eve of the new year, Tokufu concluded, You have been good to me. I shall leave you tomorrow afternoon when the snow has stopped. The disciples laughed, thinking he was aging and talking nonsense since the night was clear and without snow. But at midnight, snow began to fall, and the next day they did not find their teacher about. They went to the meditation hall. There he had passed on. Hoshin, who related this story, told his disciples, It is not necessary for a Zen master to predict his passing, but if he really wishes to do so, he can. Can you? someone asked. Yes, answered Hoshin. I will show you what I can do seven days from now. None of the disciples believed him, and most of them had even forgotten the conversation when Ho Shin next called them together. Seven days ago, he remarked, I said I was going to leave you. It is customary to write a farewell poem, but I am neither poet nor calligrapher. Let one of you inscribe my last words. His followers thought he was joking, but one of them started to write. Are you ready? Ho Shin asked. Yes, sir, replied the writer. Then Hoshin dictated, I came from brilliancy and returned to brilliancy. What is this? The poem was one line short of the customary four, so the disciple said, Master, we are one line short. Hoshin, with the roar of a conquering lion, shouted, Ka, and was gone, circumflex. Embrace the transient nature of life, recognizing the significance of mindfulness and gratitude. These stories illustrate the Zen principle of living fully in the present, appreciating each moment and connection. They remind us that in a fast-paced, future-oriented world, acknowledging the impermanence of life can lead to deeper relationships and a more meaningful existence. This teaches us to value every interaction, as we never know which might be our last. The lesson embedded in this tale underscores the importance of embracing life's impermanent nature, especially relevant in our modern, fast-paced world. It prompts us to live with mindfulness and gratitude, appreciating each moment and the people around us. This Zen principle of living fully in the present and recognizing the fleeting nature of our existence encourages deeper connections with others and a more meaningful approach to life. It reminds us that in the midst of our busy, forward-looking lives, pausing to value every interaction is crucial, as any moment could be our last. This story serves as a poignant reminder to cherish the now, fostering a life filled with richer relationships and experiences. 11. The Story of Shankai the exquisite Shankai, whose other name was Suzu, was compelled to marry against her wishes when she was quite young. Later, after this marriage had ended, she attended the university, where she studied philosophy. To see Shankai was to fall in love with her. Moreover, wherever she went, she herself fell in love with others. Love was with her at the university, 
and afterwards when philosophy did not satisfy her and she visited a temple to learn about Zen, the Zen students fell in love with her. Shankai's whole life was saturated with love. At last in Kyoto she became a real student of Zen. Her brothers in the sub-temple of Kenan praised her sincerity. One of them proved to be a congenial spirit and assisted her in the mastery of Zen. The abbot of Kenan, Mokurai, Silent Thunder, was severe. He kept the precepts himself and expected his priests to do so. In modern Japan, whatever zeal these priests have lost of Buddhism, they seem to have gained for their wives. Mokurai used to take a broom and chase the women away when he found them in any of his temples, but the more wives he swept out, the more seemed to come back. In this particular temple, the wife of the head priest became jealous of Shunkai's earnestness and beauty. Hearing the students praise her serious Zen made this wife squirm and itch. Finally, she spread a rumor about Shunkai and the young man who was her friend. As a consequence, he was expelled and Shunkai was removed from the temple. I may have made the mistake of love, thought Shunkai. But the priest's wife shall not remain in the temple either if my friend is to be treated so unjustly. Shunkai, the same night with a can of kerosene, set fire to the 500-year-old temple and burned it to the ground. In the morning, she found herself in the hands of the police. A young lawyer became interested in her and endeavored to make her sentence lighter. Do not help me, she told him. I might decide to do something else which would only imprison me again. At last, a sentence of seven years was completed, and Shung Kai was released from the prison, where the 60-year-old warden had become enamored of her. But now everyone looked upon her as a jailbird. No one would associate with her. Even the Zen people, who are supposed to believe in enlightenment in this life and with this body, shunned her. Zen, Shunkai found, was one thing and the followers of Zen quite another. Her relatives would have nothing to do with her. She grew sick, poor, and weak. She met a Shinshu priest who taught her the name of the Buddha of Love, and in this Shunkai found some solace and peace of mind. She passed away when she was still exquisitely beautiful and hardly thirty years old. She wrote her own story in a futile endeavor to support herself, and some of it she told to a woman writer. So it reached the Japanese people. Those who rejected Shunkai, those who slandered and hated her, now read of her live with tears of remorse, circumflex. Shunkai's story highlights the stark contrast between ideals and reality, especially in modern contexts. Despite her deep engagement with love and Zen philosophy, she faced societal rejection and personal tragedy. This tale underscores the complexities of human emotions and societal norms, showing that profound understanding or spiritual enlightenment doesn't guarantee acceptance or happiness in society. It illustrates the challenges of reconciling one's inner life with external realities, reminding us that judgments and actions can have lasting impacts on others. Shankai's journey from love to ostracization reveals the enduring need for compassion, understanding, and the courage to live authentically despite societal pressures. 12. Happy Chinaman Anyone walking about Chinatowns in America will observe statues of a stout fellow carrying a linen sack, Chinese merchants call him Happy Chinaman, or Laughing Buddha. This Hote lived in the Tang dynasty. He had no desire to call himself a Zen master or to gather many disciples around him. Instead, he walked the streets with a big sack into which he would put gifts of candy, fruit, or doughnuts. These he would give to children who gathered around him in play. He established a kindergarten of the streets, Whenever he met a Zen devotee, he would extend his hand and say, Give me one penny. Once as he was about to play work, another Zen master happened along and inquired, What is the significance of Zen? Hote immediately plopped his sack down on the ground in silent answer. Then, asked the other, What is the actualization of Zen? 
At once the happy Chinaman swung the sack over his shoulder and continued on his way. Circumflex. Anyone walking about Chinatowns in America will observe statues of a stout fellow carrying a linen sack. Chinese merchants call him Happy Chinaman or Laughing Buddha. This Hote lived in the Tang Dynasty. He had no desire to call himself a Zen master or to gather many disciples around him. Instead, he walked the streets with a big sack into which he would put gifts of candy, fruit, or doughnuts. These he would give to children who gathered around him in play. He established a kindergarten of the streets. Whenever he met a Zen devotee, he would extend his hand and say, Give me one penny. Once as he was about to play work, another Zen master happened along and inquired, What is the significance of Zen? Hote immediately plopped his sack down on the ground in silent answer. Then, asked the other, what is the actualization of Zen? At once the happy Chinaman swung the sack over his shoulder and continued on his way. 13. A Buddha In Tokyo in the Meiji era there lived two prominent teachers of opposite characteristics. One, Unsho, an instructor in Shingon, kept Buddha's precepts scrupulously. He never drank intoxicants, nor did he eat after eleven o'clock in the morning. The other teacher, Tanzen, a professor of philosophy at the Imperial University, never observed the precepts. When he felt like eating, he ate, and when he felt like sleeping in the daytime, he slept. One day, Unsho visited Tanzen, who was drinking wine at the time, not even a drop of which is supposed to touch the tongue of a Buddhist. Hello, brother, Tanzen greeted him. Won't you have a drink? I never drink exclaimed Unsho solemnly. One who does not drink is not even human, said Tanzen. Do you mean to call me inhuman just because I do not indulge in intoxicating liquids, exclaimed Unsho in anger. Then if I am not human, what am I? A Buddha, answered Tanzan. In modern life, the story of Unsho and Tanzan teaches the importance of balance and understanding diverse perspectives. While Unsho strictly adheres to traditional rules, Tanzan embraces flexibility and personal fulfillment. This contrast highlights that rigidly following norms without considering personal values or the context may limit one's experience and growth. Tanzan's playful response suggests that strict adherence to rules does not necessarily make one superior. It's the balance and understanding of one's own path that truly matters. It encourages embracing individuality while respecting different approaches to life. 14. Muddy Road Tanzan and Ikido were once traveling together down a muddy road. A heavy rain was still falling. Coming around a bend, they met a lovely girl in a silk kimono and sash, unable to cross the intersection. Come on, girl, said Tanzan at once. Lifting her in his arms, he carried her over the mud. Ekido did not speak again until that night when they reached a lodging temple. Then he no longer could restrain himself. We monks don't do near females, he told Tanzan, especially not young and lovely ones. It is dangerous. Why did you do that? I left the girl there, said Tanzan. Are you still carrying her? Circumflex. In a world cluttered with rules and restrictions, the story of Tanzan and Ikido highlights the importance of compassion and adaptability. Tanzan's act of carrying the girl across the mud, despite the monk's vow of avoiding women, underscores the essence of understanding the spirit of the law over its letter. In modern life, this teaches us the value of prioritizing human kindness and practical solutions over rigid adherence to norms or conventions. It reminds us to let go of burdensome thoughts and judgments that hinder our ability to act freely and benevolently. The core lesson here is about the importance of flexibility and the willingness to prioritize empathy and immediate human needs over strict rules or preconceptions. 
This story encourages letting go of preoccupations that distract us from living fully and compassionately in the present moment, a highly relevant lesson in today's fast-paced and often impersonal world. 15. Shon and his mother Shun became a teacher of Soto Zen. When he was still a student, his father passed away, leaving him to care for his old mother. Whenever Shaun went to a meditation hall, he always took his mother with him. Since she accompanied him when he visited monasteries, he could not live with the monks. So he would build a little house and care for her there. He would copy sutras, Buddhist verses, and in this manner receive a few coins for food. When Shun bought fish for his mother, the people would scoff at him, for a monk is not supposed to eat fish. But Shun did not mind. His mother, however, was hurt to see the others laugh at her son. Finally, she told Shun, I think I will become a nun. I can be a vegetarian, too. She did, and they studied together. Shun was fond of music and was a master of the harp, which his mother also played. On full moon nights, they used to play together. One night, a young lady passed by their house and heard music. Deeply touched, she invited Shun to visit her the next evening and play. He accepted the invitation. A few days later, he met the young lady on the street and thanked her for her hospitality. Others laughed at him. He had visited the house of a woman of the streets. One day, Shun left for a distant temple to deliver a lecture. A few months afterwards, he returned home to find his mother dead. Friends had not known where to reach him, so the funeral was then in progress. Shun walked up and hit the coffin with his staff. Mother, your son has returned, he said. I am glad to see you have returned, son, he answered for his mother. Yes, I am glad too, Shun responded. Then he announced to the people about him, The funeral ceremony is over. You may bury the body. When Shun was old, he knew his end was approaching. He asked his disciples to gather around him in the morning, telling them he was going to pass on at noon. Burning incense before the picture of his mother and his old teacher, he wrote a poem. For fifty-six years I lived as best I could, making my way in this world. Now the rain has ended, the clouds are clearing, the blue sky has a full moon. His disciples gathered about him, reciting a sutra, and Shaun passed on during the invocation, circumflex. This story, distilled into a fifty-word essence, presents a powerful lesson about compassion, filial duty, and the pursuit of one's path regardless of societal norms. Shun exemplifies dedication to family and personal values, teaching that true fulfillment lies in honoring our responsibilities and passions, even in the face of judgment or adversity. The narrative of Shun and his unwavering commitment to his mother amidst societal expectations offers a significant lesson for modern life. In an era where individual achievement often takes precedence, Shaun's story reminds us of the importance of care, compassion, and the strength found in pursuing one's beliefs and duties, even when they go against the grain. His life demonstrates that fulfillment and enlightenment can be achieved not by forsaking personal ties for spiritual or professional advancement, but by integrating our responsibilities to others with our personal journeys. This balance between personal growth and caring for loved ones is increasingly relevant today as we navigate the complexities of modern life, reminding us that true success encompasses both our achievements and our ability to maintain and honor our human connections. 16. Not far from Buddhahood. A university student while visiting Gassen asked him, have you even read the Christian Bible? No, read it to me, said Gassan. The student opened the Bible and read from St. Matthew. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, 
for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Ghassan said, Whoever uttered those words I consider an enlightened man. The student continued reading, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Ghassan remarked, That is excellent. Whoever said that is not far from Buddhahood. In a world where anxiety and materialism often overshadow simplicity and faith, this story highlights the universal truth across religious teachings, the value of living in the present and trusting in the natural flow of life. It underscores the importance of seeking, asking, and opening oneself to the possibilities, emphasizing that enlightenment and peace aren't confined to any one belief system, but are accessible to all who embrace these principles in their daily lives. This message is particularly resonant in modern society, encouraging individuals to transcend the frantic pursuit of material success and to find contentment and purpose in the simplicity and serenity of the present moment. 17. Stingy in Teaching A young physician in Tokyo named Kusuda met a college friend who had been studying Zen. The young doctor asked him what Zen was. I cannot tell you what it is, the friend replied, but one thing is certain. If you understand Zen, you will not be afraid to die. That's fine, said Kusuda. I will try it. Where can I find a teacher? Go to the Master Nan Inn, the friend told him. So Kusuda went to call on Nan Inn. He carried a dagger nine and a half inches long to determine whether or not the teacher was afraid to die. When Nan Inn saw Kusuda, he exclaimed, Hello, friend. How are you? We haven't seen each other for a long time. This perplexed Kusuda, who replied, We have never met before. That's right, answered Nan Inn. I mistook you for another physician who is receiving instruction here. With such a beginning, Kusuda lost his chance to test the master, so reluctantly he asked if he might receive Zen instruction. Nan In said, Zen is not a difficult task. If you are a physician, treat you patients with kindness. That is Zen. Kusuda visited Nan In three times. Each time Nan In told him the same thing. A physician should not waste time around here. Go home and take care of you patients. It was not yet clear to Kusuda how such teaching could remove the fear of death. So on his fourth visit he complained, My friend told me when one learns Zen one loses the fear of death. Each time I come here all you tell me is to take care of my patients. I know that much. If that is your so-called Zen, I am not going to visit you anymore. Nan In smiled and patted the doctor. I have been too strict with you. Let me give you a koan. He presented Kusuda with Joshu's Mu to work over, which is the first mind-enlightening problem in the book called The Gateless Gate. Kusuda pondered this problem of Mu, no thing, for two years. At length he thought he had reached certainty of mind, but his teacher commented, You are not in yet. Kusuda continued in concentration for another year and a half. His mind became placid. Problems dissolved. No thing became the truth. He served his patients well, and without even knowing it, he was free from concern over life and death. Then when he visited Nan In, his old teacher just smiled, circumflex. In modern life, we often seek complex solutions to our fears and challenges, focusing outwardly. This story illustrates the profound simplicity within Zen philosophy. True understanding and peace come from fulfilling our roles with compassion and mindfulness. The physician's journey from seeking to test his teacher's fear of death to embodying Zen through dedicated patient care reveals a fundamental truth. By engaging deeply in our daily responsibilities and embracing the present moment, we can dissolve our fears, including the fear of death. This narrative encourages us to look inward and find meaning in our actions, 
teaching us that enlightenment and peace are achievable through simple, sincere engagement with life's duties. 18. A Parable Buddha told a parable in a sutra. A man traveling across a field encountered a tiger. He fled, the tiger after him. Coming to a precipice, he caught hold of the root of a wild vine and swung himself down over the edge. The tiger sniffed at him from above. Trembling, the man looked down to where, far below, another tiger was waiting to eat him. Only the vine sustained him. Two mice, one white and one black, little by little started to gnaw away the vine. The man saw a luscious strawberry near him. Grasping the vine with one hand, he plucked the strawberry with the other. How sweet it tasted! Circumflex! In a modern world full of challenges and dangers, akin to the tiger's and precarious vine in Buddha's parable, we often find ourselves facing threats from many directions. The story symbolizes life's fragility and the constant presence of danger represented by the tigers and the gnawing mice. Yet, it also teaches us about the importance of living in the moment and appreciating the joys and pleasures available to us no matter how small they may seem. The act of tasting the strawberry signifies the ability to find happiness and contentment even in the midst of peril and uncertainty. It's a reminder to not lose sight of the beauty and sweetness life offers despite the inevitable challenges and fears we face. 19. The First Principle When one goes to Obaku Temple in Kyoto, he sees carved over the gate the words, the first principle. The letters are unusually large, and those who appreciate calligraphy always admire them as being a masterpiece. They were drawn by Kozen 200 years ago. When the master drew them, he did so on paper, from which the workmen made the large carving in wood. As Kozen sketched the letters, a bold pupil was with him, who had made several gallons of ink for the calligraphy, and who never failed to criticize his master's work. That is not good, he told Kozen after his first effort. How is this one? Poor. Worse than before, pronounced the pupil. Kozen patiently wrote one sheet after another until 84 first principles had accumulated, still without the approval of the pupil. Then when the young man stepped outside for a few moments, Kozen thought, now this is my chance to escape his keen eye, and he wrote hurriedly, with a mind free from distraction, the first principle, a masterpiece, pronounced the pupil. Circumflex. When one goes to Obaku Temple in Kyoto, he sees carved over the gate the words, the first principle. The letters are unusually large, and those who appreciate calligraphy always admire them as being a masterpiece. They were drawn by Kozen 200 years ago. When the master drew them, he did so on paper, from which the workmen made the large carving in wood. As Kozen sketched the letters, a bold pupil was with him who had made several gallons of ink for the calligraphy and who never failed to criticize his master's work. That is not good, he told Kozen after his first effort. How is this one? Poor. Worse than before pronounced the pupil. Kozen patiently wrote one sheet after another until 84 first principles had accumulated, still without the approval of the pupil. Then, when the young man stepped outside for a few moments, Kozen thought, now this is my chance to escape his keen eye, and he wrote hurriedly, with a mind free from distraction, the first principle. A masterpiece, pronounced the pupil. 20. A mother's advice. Jiun, a shogun master, was a well-known Sanskrit scholar of the Tokugawa era. When he was young, he used to deliver lectures to his brother students. His mother heard about this and wrote him a letter. Son, I do not think you became a devotee of the Buddha because you desired to turn into a walking dictionary for others. There is no end to information and commentation, glory and honor. I wish you would stop this lecture business. Shut yourself up in a little temple in a remote part of the mountain. 
devote your time to meditation and in this way attain true realization. Circumflex In a world overwhelmed by the constant flood of information, the story of Jiyun, a shogun master and Sanskrit scholar, offers a poignant lesson. His mother's advice reflects a timeless wisdom. True knowledge and enlightenment come not from external accolades or endless learning, but from introspection and inner peace. In today's digital age, where information is incessant and distractions are omnipresent, her counsel is more relevant than ever. It urges us to find solace in solitude, to disconnect in order to truly connect with ourselves, and to prioritize the quality of our knowledge over its quantity. This narrative encourages a return to simplicity, advocating for a life where understanding and personal growth are derived from within, not without. 21. The Sound of One Hand The master of Kenan Temple was Mokurai, Silent Thunder. He had a little protege named Toyo who was only 12 years old. Toyo saw the older disciples visit the master's room each morning and evening to receive instruction in Sanzen or personal guidance in which they were given koans to stop mind-wandering. Toyo wished to do Sanzen also. Wait a while, said Mokurai. You are too young. But the child insisted, so the teacher finally consented. In the evening, little Toyo went at the proper time to the threshold of Mokurai's Sanzen room. He struck the gong to announce his presence, bowed respectfully three times outside the door, and went to sit before the master in respectful silence. You can hear the sound of two hands when they clap together, said Mokurai. Now show me the sound of one hand. Toyo bowed and went to his room to consider this problem. From his window, he could hear the music of the geishas. Ah, I have it, he proclaimed. The next evening, when his teacher asked him to illustrate the sound of one hand, Toyo began to play the music of the geishas. No, no, said Mokurai. That will never do. That is not the sound of one hand. You've not got it at all. Thinking that such music might interrupt, Toyo moved his abode to a quiet place. He meditated again. What can the sound of one hand be? He happened to hear some water dripping. I have it, imagined Toyo. When he next appeared before his teacher, he imitated dripping water. What is that? asked Mokurai. That is the sound of dripping water, but not the sound of one hand. Try again. In vain, Toyo meditated to hear the sound of one hand. He heard the sighing of the wind, but the sound was rejected. He heard the cry of an owl. This was also refused. The sound of one hand was not the locusts. For more than ten times, Toyo visited Mokurai with different sounds. All were wrong. For almost a year, he pondered what the sound of one hand might be. At last, Toyo entered true meditation and transcended all sounds. I could collect no more, he explained later, so I reached the soundless sound. Toyo had realized the sound of one hand, circumflex. In modern life, the story of Toyo and the sound of one hand speaks to the importance of persistence, deep contemplation, and inner peace. It suggests that true understanding and enlightenment cannot be achieved through external distractions or superficial answers. Instead, it requires dedication, a willingness to look beyond the obvious, and an inner journey that transcends the noise of everyday life. This teaches us the value of introspection and the power of silence in an age dominated by constant stimulation and the quest for immediate gratification. It reminds us to seek depth in our experiences and wisdom in our pursuits, advocating for a mindfulness that is increasingly necessary in our fast-paced world. 22. My heart burns like fire. Soyan Shaku, the first Zen teacher to come to America, said, My heart burns like fire, but my eyes are as cold as dead ashes. He made the following rules which he practiced every day of his life. In the morning before dressing, light incense and meditate. 
retire at a regular hour, partake of food at regular intervals, eat with moderation and never to the point of satisfaction, receive a guest with the same attitude you have when alone, when alone, maintain the same attitude you have in receiving guests, watch what you say, and whatever you say, practice it. When an opportunity comes, do not let it pass you by, yet always think twice before acting. Do not regret the past. Look to the future. Have the fearless attitude of a hero and the loving heart of a child. Upon retiring, sleep as if you had entered your last sleep. Upon awakening, leave your bed behind you instantly as if you had cast away a pair of old shoes. Soyan Shaku the first Zen teacher to come to America said, My heart burns like fire, but my eyes are as cold as dead ashes. He made the following rules which he practiced every day of his life. In the morning before dressing, light incense and meditate. Retire at a regular hour. Partake of food at regular intervals. Eat with moderation and never to the point of satisfaction. Receive a guest with the same attitude you have when alone. When alone, maintain the same attitude you have in receiving guests. Watch what you say and whatever you say, practice it. When an opportunity comes, do not let it pass you by, yet always think twice before acting. Do not regret the past. Look to the future. Have the fearless attitude of a hero and the loving heart of a child. Upon retiring, Sleep as if you had entered your last sleep. Upon awakening, leave your bed behind you instantly as if you had cast away a pair of old shoes. 23. Eshun's Departure When Eshun, the Zen nun, was past sixty and about to leave this world, she asked some monks to pile up wood in the yard. Seating herself firmly in the center of the funeral pyre, she had it set fire around the edges. Oh, none, shouted one monk, is it hot in there? Such a matter would concern only a stupid person like yourself, answered Eshun. The flames arose, and she passed away. Circumflex. In a world driven by instant gratification and superficial concerns, Eshun's story teaches us about detachment, inner peace, and the ultimate acceptance of life's transient nature. By willingly embracing her end, Eshin demonstrates profound courage and a deep understanding that life's essence isn't found in external conditions, but in how we internally navigate our experiences. Her dismissive response to the monk's question underscores the irrelevance of physical discomfort when one reaches a state of spiritual enlightenment. This narrative encourages modern individuals to seek depth in their lives, emphasizing the importance of mental fortitude and the liberation found in letting go of worldly attachments. 24. Recite Sutras A farmer requested a Tendai priest to recite sutras for his wife, who had died. After the recitation was over, the farmer asked, Do you think my wife will gain merit from this? Not only your wife, but all sentient beings will benefit from the recitation of sutras, answered the priest. If you say all sentient beings will benefit, said the farmer, my wife may be very weak, and others will take advantage of her, getting the benefits she should have. So, please recite sutras just for her. The priest explained that it was the desire of a Buddhist to offer blessings and wish merit for every living being. That is a fine teaching, concluded the farmer, but please make one exception. I have a neighbor who is rough and mean to me. Just exclude him from all those sentient beings. Circumflex. In a story, a farmer asks a priest to pray for his deceased wife, hoping it will benefit her in the afterlife. The priest says the prayers benefit all beings, not just the wife. The farmer worries his wife's share of the benefits will be diluted. He learns about universal compassion, but hesitates to extend it to a disagreeable neighbor. This tale mirrors modern life, teaching us about inclusivity, compassion, and the challenge of applying these ideals universally. 
It highlights our tendency to limit our kindness to those we favor, reminding us that true compassion knows no bounds, even in the face of personal grievances. 25. Three days more. Suiwo, the disciple of Hakuin, was a good teacher. During one summer seclusion period, a pupil came to him from a southern island of Japan. Suiwo gave him the problem, hear the sound of one hand. The pupil remained three years but could not pass the test. One night he came in tears to Suiwo. I must return south in shame and embarrassment, he said, for I cannot solve my problem. Wait one week more and meditate constantly, advised Suiwo. Still no enlightenment came to the pupil. Try for another week, said Suiwo. The pupil obeyed, but in vain. Still another week. Yet this was of no avail. In despair, the student begged to be released, but Suiwo requested another meditation of five days. They were without result. Then he said, Meditate for three days longer, then if you fail to attain enlightenment, you had better kill yourself. On the second day, the pupil was enlightened. Circumflex. The story of Suiwo and his pupil teaches the value of perseverance, dedication, and the importance of a guiding mentor. In today's fast-paced world, we often seek immediate results and give up too easily. However, some of life's most valuable lessons and achievements come only after extended periods of effort and struggle. This tale reminds us that sometimes it is only through facing our deepest frustrations and challenges head-on with patience and continuous effort that we can achieve enlightenment or reach our goals. It underscores the importance of persistence, the willingness to endure hardship, and the significance of guidance in our journey towards personal growth and understanding. 26. Trading dialogue for lodging. Provided he makes and wins an argument about Buddhism with those who live there, any wandering monk can remain in a Zen temple. If he is defeated, he has to move on. In a temple in the northern part of Japan, two brother monks were dwelling together. The elder one was learned, but the younger one was stupid and had but one eye. A wandering monk came and asked for lodging, properly challenging them to a debate about the sublime teaching. The elder brother, tired that day from much studying, told the younger one to take his place. Go and request the dialogue in silence, he cautioned. So the young monk and the stranger went to the shrine and sat down. Shortly afterwards, the traveler rose and went in to the elder brother and said, Your young brother is a wonderful fellow. He defeated me. Relate the dialogue to me, said the elder one. Well, explained the traveler, first I held up one finger, representing Buddha, the enlightened one. So he held up two fingers, signifying Buddha and his teaching. I held up three fingers, representing Buddha, his teaching, and his followers, living the harmonious life. Then he shook his clenched fist in my face, indicating that all three come from one realization, Thus he won, and so I have no right to remain here. With this, the traveler left. Where is that fellow? asked the younger one, running in to his elder brother. I understand you won the debate. Won nothing. I'm going to beat him up. Tell me the subject of the debate, asked the elder one. Why, the minute he saw me, he held up one finger, insulting me by insinuating that I have only one eye. Since he was a stranger, I thought I would be polite to him, so I held up two fingers, congratulating him that he has two eyes. Then the impolite wretch held up three fingers, suggesting that between us we only have three eyes. So I got mad and started to punch him, but he ran out and that ended it. Circumflex In this tale, a misunderstanding between the monks and a wandering monk turns into a profound lesson about perception and communication. The younger monk, perceived as unlearned and simple, unwittingly wins a debate on Buddhism without even realizing it. This story underscores the idea that wisdom and insight can come from unexpected places, and that victory in debate or life 
isn't always about what is spoken, but what is understood. In modern life, this teaches us the importance of open-mindedness, the value of nonverbal communication, and the beauty of finding depth in simplicity. It reminds us that true understanding and enlightenment often lie beyond words and that assumptions can blind us to the wisdom in others. 27. The Voice of Happiness After Bunkei had passed away, a blind man who lived near the Master's temple told a friend, Since I am blind, I cannot watch a person's face, so I must judge his character by the sound of his voice. Ordinarily, when I hear someone congratulate another upon his happiness or success, I also hear a secret tone of envy. When condolence is expressed for the misfortune of another, I hear pleasure and satisfaction, as if the one condoling was really glad there was something left to gain in his own world. In all my experience, however, Bankai's voice was always sincere. Whenever he expressed happiness, I heard nothing but happiness, and whenever he expressed sorrow, sorrow was all I heard. Circumflex This story underscores the rarity of genuine empathy in today's society. It highlights how often people mask their true feelings of envy or satisfaction at others' expense under the guise of congratulations or condolences. Banquet's sincerity, evident in his unfeigned emotions, sets a standard for authentic human connections. His example teaches us the value of true empathy and honesty in interactions. In an age of superficial connections, this lesson emphasizes the importance of being genuinely happy for others' successes and sincerely compassionate during their times of distress. 28. Open Your Own Treasure House Daiju visited the Master Basso in China. Basso asked, What do you seek? Enlightenment, replied Daiju. You have your own treasure house. Why do you search outside? Basso asked. Daiju inquired, Where is my treasure house? Basso answered, What you are asking is your treasure house. Daiju was delighted. Ever after he urged his friends, open your own treasure house and use those treasures. Circumflex In modern life, this story underscores the importance of recognizing and utilizing our inherent potential and wisdom. Often, we seek happiness and fulfillment externally, overlooking the vast resources within us. Master Basso's dialogue with Daiju highlights the realization that enlightenment or personal fulfillment isn't found in external pursuits, but by introspecting and tapping into our inner strengths and capabilities. This tale encourages self-reliance, urging us to explore and utilize our own capabilities to navigate life's challenges, emphasizing that the key to contentment and success lies within us, not in external validations or acquisitions. 29. No Water, No Moon when the nun Chiyono studied Zen under Buko of Engaku, she was unable to attain the fruits of meditation for a long time. At last, one moonlit night she was carrying water in an old pail bound with bamboo. The bamboo broke and the bottom fell out of the pail, and at that moment Chiyono was set free. In commemoration she wrote a poem. In this way and that I tried to save the old pail since the bamboo strip was weakening and about to break, until at last the bottom fell out. No more water in the pail, no more moon in the water, circumflex. In a modern context, Chiyono's story exemplifies the liberation found in releasing attachment to outcomes and material possessions. Struggling to maintain the pail, akin to clinging to preconceived notions or material goods, prevents spiritual and personal growth. The moment the pail breaks, Chiyono experiences enlightenment, symbolizing the peace and freedom that come with letting go of attachments. This teaches us to embrace impermanence, understanding that true contentment and enlightenment come from acceptance and living in the present, 
rather than holding on to the past or fearing the future. It's a reminder to focus on the essence of experiences rather than their form. 30. Calling Card Keichu, the great Zen teacher of the Meiji era, was the head of Tofuku, a cathedral in Kyoto. One day the governor of Kyoto called upon him for the first time. His attendant presented the card of the governor which read, Kitagaki, governor of Kyoto. I have no business with such a fellow, said Keichu to his attendant. Tell him to get out of here. The attendant carried the card back with apologies. That was my error, said the governor, and with a pencil he scratched out the words, Governor of Kyoto. Ask your teacher again. Oh, is that Kitagaki? exclaimed the teacher when he saw the card. I want to see that fellow. Circumflex. In a modern world often defined by titles and status, this story reminds us to look beyond superficial labels to the essence of individuals. The Zen teacher's initial refusal to meet with the governor because of his title, and subsequent willingness once the title was removed, underscores the importance of recognizing each person's inherent value rather than their societal role. It teaches us to foster connections based on genuine human qualities, not on the perceived power or prestige attached to one's position. This lesson is crucial today, where social hierarchies can overshadow the fundamental respect and equality every person deserves. 31. Everything is best. When Banzan was walking through a market, he overheard a conversation between a butcher and his customer. Give me the best piece of meat you have, said the customer. Everything in my shop is the best, replied the butcher. You cannot find here any piece of meat that is not the best. At these words, Banzan became enlightened, circumflex. In the story, Keichu teaches a powerful lesson about humility and authenticity in human interactions. Stripped of titles and societal positions, we are encouraged to engage with each other on a more genuine, human level. This principle holds profound relevance in today's modern life, where social media and professional titles often overshadow the value of true, unpretentious connections. It reminds us that real respect and understanding come not from one's status or achievements, but from our willingness to see beyond these superficial layers to the individual's true essence. This lesson urges us to prioritize genuine relationships over societal accolades, fostering a more authentic and fulfilling way of living. 32. Inch Time Foot Gem A lord asked Taquan, a Zen teacher, to suggest how he might pass the time. He felt his days very long attending his office and sitting stiffly to receive the homage of others. Takwan wrote eight Chinese characters and gave them to the man. Not twice this day. Inch time foot gem. This day will not come again. Each minute is worth a priceless gem. Circumflex. In a Zen lesson, Takwan advised appreciating each moment's unique value. He highlighted life's fleeting nature, reminding us that time is precious. Modern life, often fast-paced and distracted, can benefit from this wisdom. Embracing the present, we find richness in every second, leading to a more fulfilled existence. This lesson teaches the importance of mindfulness and the appreciation of the present moment, a concept increasingly relevant in today's fast-paced, technology-driven world. It encourages us to slow down, recognize the value of each moment, and not take time for granted, thereby enhancing our quality of life and deepening our connections with others and the world around us. 33. Mokusen's Hand Mokusen Hiki was living in a temple in the province of Tamba. One of his adherents complained of the stinginess of his wife. Mokusen visited the adherent's wife and showed her his clenched fist before her face. What do you mean by that? asked the surprised woman. Suppose my fist were always like that. 
What would you call it? he asked. Deformed, replied the woman. The he opened his hand flat in her face and asked, Suppose it were always like that. What then? Another kind of deformity, said the wife. If you understand that much, finished Mokusen, you are a good wife. Then he left. After his visit, this wife helped her husband to distribute as well as to save, circumflex. In a story, Mokusen Hiki teaches about balance through a simple gesture. Showing clenched and open hands, he illustrates that neither extreme, holding too tightly nor giving too freely, is desirable. Life, like a hand, functions best with a balance between saving and sharing. This lesson underscores the importance of moderation and generosity in modern living, where the pressures of materialism and scarcity often tilt us towards extremes. Embracing this balance can lead to healthier relationships and a more fulfilling life. 34. A Smile in His Lifetime Moku Gen was never known to smile until his last day on earth. When his time came to pass away, he said to his faithful ones, You have studied under me for more than ten years. Show me your real interpretation of Zen. Whoever expresses this most clearly shall buy my successor and receive my robe and bowl. Everyone watched Mokugan's severe face, but no one answered. Encho, a disciple who had been with his teacher for a long time, moved near the bedside. He pushed forward the medicine cup a few inches. This was his answer to the command. The teacher's face became even more severe. Is that all you understand? he asked. Encho reached out and moved the cup back again. A beautiful smile broke over the features of Mok again. You rascal he told Encho. You worked with me ten years and have not yet seen my whole body. Take the robe and bowl. They belong to you. Circumflex In this modern tale, a Zen master's last lesson transcends words, teaching us that understanding often lies beyond the spoken. Encho's silent gestures, moving a medicine cup back and forth, embody the essence of Zen, presence, mindfulness, and the significance of actions over words. In our fast-paced digital era, this story is a powerful reminder of the importance of being present and the profound impact of our actions. It encourages us to look deeper, beyond the surface of interactions, and to value the unspoken understanding and connections we share with others. This narrative is a call to appreciate the simplicity and depth of nonverbal communication highlighting its relevance in fostering meaningful relationships and understanding in our contemporary world. 35. Every Minute Zen Zen students are with their masters at least two years before they presume to teach others. Nan In was visited by Tenno, who, having passed his apprenticeship, had become a teacher. The day happened to be rainy, so Tenno wore wooden clogs and carried an umbrella. After greeting him, Nan In remarked, I suppose you left your wooden clogs in the vestibule. I want to know if your umbrella is on the right or left side of the clogs. Tenno, confused, had no instant answer. He realized that he was unable to carry his zen every minute. He became Nan In's pupil, and he studied six more years to accomplish his every-minute zen. Circumflex In a world filled with distractions, this Zen tale underscores the importance of mindfulness and presence. The question about the umbrella challenges Tenno, highlighting his lack of awareness in the moment. Modern life, with its constant demands on our attention, makes practicing such mindfulness more crucial yet challenging. The story teaches that true mastery in any discipline requires a deep, ongoing commitment to being fully present and attentive to the details of our lives. It's a reminder that learning and growth are continuous processes, demanding not just intellectual understanding but lived experience and awareness in every moment. 36. Flower Shower Subhuti was Buddha's disciple. He was able to understand the potency of emptiness, 
the viewpoint that nothing exists except in its relationship of subjectivity and objectivity. One day, Subhuti, in a mood of sublime emptiness, was sitting under a tree. Flowers began to fall about him. We are praising you for your discourse on emptiness, the gods whispered to him. But I have not spoken of emptiness, said Subhuti. You have not spoken of emptiness. We have not heard emptiness, responded the gods. This is true emptiness. And blossoms showered upon Subhuto as rain. Circumflex. In a modern world cluttered with information and material desires, the story of Subhuti teaches us the value of understanding and embracing emptiness. This ancient wisdom highlights the importance of perceiving our interconnectedness and the subjective nature of existence. By recognizing that true meaning and fulfillment come not from the external accumulation of things, but from an inner state of peace and understanding, we can navigate life's complexities with greater clarity and purpose. The lesson here is profound yet simple. In emptiness, we find the essence of being and the key to genuine contentment. 37. Publishing the Sutras Tetsugen, a devotee of Zen in Japan, decided to publish the sutras, which at that time were available only in Chinese. The books were to be printed with wood blocks in an edition of 7,000 copies, a tremendous undertaking. Tetsugen began by traveling and collecting donations for this purpose. A few sympathizers would give him a hundred pieces of gold, but most of the time he received only small coins. He thanked each donor with equal gratitude. After ten years, Tetsugen had enough money to begin his task. It happened that at that time the Uji River overflowed. Famine followed. Tetsugen took the funds he had collected for the books and spent them to save others from starvation. Then he began again his work of collecting. Several years afterwards, an epidemic spread over the country. Tetsugen again gave away what he had collected to help his people. For a third time he started his work, and after twenty years his wish was fulfilled. The printing blocks which produced the first edition of sutras can be seen today in the Obaku Monastery in Kyoto. The Japanese tell their children that Tetsugen made three sets of sutras and that the first two invisible sets surpass even the last. Circumflex. Tetsugen's story illuminates perseverance, compassion, and the true essence of wealth. In modern life, it reminds us that true success isn't measured by material achievements, but by our impact on others' lives. His dedication to altruism over personal goals underscores the value of selflessness. Even when his mission was delayed, he prioritized community welfare, teaching us that helping others is the most profound legacy we can leave. Tetsugen's life is a testament to the fact that the greatest achievements often come from the heart, not the hands. 38. Gisho's Work Gisho was ordained as a nun when she was ten years old. She received training just as the little boys did. When she reached the age of sixteen, she traveled from one Zen master to another, studying with them all. She remained three years with Unzon, six years with Guke, but was unable to obtain a clear vision. At last, she went to the master Inzon. Inzon showed her no distinction at all on account of her sex. He scolded her like a thunderstorm. He cuffed her to awaken her inner nature. Gisho remained with Inzan thirteen years, and then she found that which she was seeking. In her honor, Inzan wrote a poem. This nun studied thirteen years under my guidance. In the evening she considered the deepest koans. In the morning she was wrapped in other koans. The Chinese nun Tetsuma surpassed all before her, and since Mujaku none has been so genuine as this Gisho, Yet there are many more gates for her to pass through. She should receive still more blows from my iron fist. After Gisho was enlightened, she went to the province of Banshu, started her own Zen temple, 
and taught 200 other nuns until she passed away one year in the month of August. Circumflex This story exemplifies perseverance, equality, and the pursuit of enlightenment. Gisho's journey shows that regardless of gender, achieving understanding requires dedication and hard work. Her progression under various masters, culminating in enlightenment under Inzan, underscores the importance of resilience and open-mindedness in overcoming obstacles and biases. In today's fast-paced world where distractions are rampant, Gisho's tale reminds us to stay focused on our goals, seek guidance without prejudice, and embrace challenges as opportunities for growth. It celebrates the breaking of gender norms and highlights the universal potential for spiritual and personal development. 39. Sleeping in the Daytime The master Soyan Shaku passed from this world when he was 61 years of age. Fulfilling his life's work, he left a great teaching, far richer than that of most Zen masters. His pupils used to sleep in the daytime during midsummer, and while he overlooked this, he himself never wasted a minute. When he was but 12 years old, he was already studying Tendai philosophical speculation. One summer day, the air had been so sultry that little Soyan stretched his legs and went to sleep while his teacher was away. Three hours passed when, suddenly waking, he heard his master enter, but it was too late. There he lay, sprawled across the doorway. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon, his teacher whispered, stepping carefully over Soyen's body as if it were that of some distinguished guest. After this, Soyen never slept again in the afternoon. Circumflex. The master, Soyen Shaku, passed from this world when he was 61 years of age. Fulfilling his life's work, he left a great teaching, far richer than that of most Zen masters. His pupils used to sleep in the daytime during midsummer, and while he overlooked this, he himself never wasted a minute. When he was but 12 years old, he was already studying Tendai philosophical speculation. One summer day, the air had been so sultry that little Soyan stretched his legs and went to sleep while his teacher was away. Three hours passed when, suddenly waking, he heard his master enter, but it was too late. There he lay, sprawled across the doorway. I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon, his teacher whispered, stepping carefully over Soyan's body as if it were that of some distinguished guest. After this, Soyan never slept again in the afternoon. 40. In Dreamland Our schoolmaster used to take a nap every afternoon, related a disciple of Soyan Shaku. We children asked him why he did it, and he told us, I go to Dreamland to meet the old sages just as Confucius did. When Confucius slept, he would dream of ancient sages and later tell his followers about them. It was extremely hot one day, so some of us took a nap. Our schoolmaster scolded us. We went to Dreamland to meet the ancient sages the same as Confucius did, we explained. What was the message from those sages, our schoolmaster demanded. One of us replied, We went to Dreamland and met the sages and asked them if our schoolmaster came there every afternoon, but they said they had never seen any such fellow. Circumflex Our schoolmaster used to take a nap every afternoon, related a disciple of Soyan Shaku. We children asked him why he did it, and he told us, I go to Dreamland to meet the old sages just as Confucius did. When Confucius slept, he would dream of ancient sages and later tell his followers about them. It was extremely hot one day, so some of us took a nap. Our schoolmaster scolded us. We went to Dreamland to meet the ancient sages the same as Confucius did, we explained. What was the message from those sages, our schoolmaster demanded. One of us replied, We went to Dreamland and met the sages and asked them if our schoolmaster came there every afternoon, but they said they had never seen any such fellow. 41. Joshu's Zen Joshu began the study of Zen when he was 60 years old and continued until he was 80 when he realized Zen. 
He taught from the age of 80 until he was 120. A student once asked him, If I haven't anything in my mind, what shall I do? Joshu replied, Throw it out. But if I haven't anything, how can I throw it out? Continued the questioner. Well, said Joshu, then carry it out. Circumflex. Joshu began the study of Zen when he was 60 years old and continued until he was 80 when he realized Zen. He taught from the age of 80 until he was 120. A student once asked him, If I haven't anything in my mind, what shall I do? Joshu replied, Throw it out. But if I haven't anything, how can I throw it out? Continued the questioner. Well, said Joshu, then carry it out. 42. The Dead Man's Answer When Mamiya, who later became a well-known preacher, went to a teacher for personal guidance, he was asked to explain the sound of one hand. Mamiya concentrated upon what the sound of one hand might be. You are not working hard enough, his teacher told him. You are too attached to food, wealth, things, and that sound. It would be better if you died. That would solve the problem. The next time Mamiya appeared before his teacher, he was again asked what he had to show regarding the sound of one hand. Mamiya at once fell over as if he were dead. You are dead all right, observed the teacher. But how about that sound? I haven't solved that yet, replied Mamiya, looking up. Dead men do not speak, said the teacher. Get out. Circumflex. In a modern context, this story emphasizes the importance of detachment and the pursuit of enlightenment beyond material desires. It suggests that true understanding and spiritual growth require letting go of superficial attachments and focusing on deeper existential questions. The teacher's harsh methods highlight the necessity of profound personal transformation to grasp such elusive truths. This lesson is pertinent today, where materialism often overshadows spiritual or existential exploration, reminding us to seek balance and deeper meaning in our lives. 43. Zen in a Beggar's Life Tosui was a well-known Zen teacher of his time. He had lived in several temples and taught in various provinces. The last temple he visited accumulated so many adherents that Tosui told them he was going to quit the lecture business entirely. He advised them to disperse and go wherever they desired. After that, no one could find any trace of him. Three years later, one of his disciples discovered him living with some beggars under a bridge in Kyoto. He at once implored Tosui to teach him. If you can do as I do for even a couple days, I might. Tosui replied. So the former disciple dressed as a beggar and spent the day with Tosui. The following day, one of the beggars died. Tosui and his pupil carried the body off at midnight and buried it on a mountainside. After that, they returned to their shelter under the bridge. Tosui slept soundly the remainder of the night, but the disciple could not sleep. When morning came, Tosui said, We do not have to beg food today. Our dead friend has left some over there. But the disciple was unable to eat a single bite of it. I have said you could not do as I, concluded Tosui. Get out of here and do not bother me again. Circumflex. In a world where success is often measured by material wealth and status, the story of Tosui offers a profound lesson. Tosui, once a renowned Zen teacher, chose to abandon his influential position to live humbly among beggars under a bridge. This drastic shift underscores the value of simplicity, humility, and the inner journey over external achievements. Tosui's refusal to teach his former disciple until he could truly embrace this way of life highlights the importance of experiential understanding and the difficulty of letting go of societal norms and personal expectations. In modern life, where the pursuit of success can lead to stress and disconnection, 
Tosui's story reminds us of the significance of finding contentment in simplicity and the essential connection to our inner selves beyond the trappings of societal success. 44. The Thief Who Became a Disciple One evening, as Shichiri Kojun was reciting sutras, a thief with a sharp sword entered, demanding either money or his life. Shichiri told him, Do not disturb me. You can find the money in that drawer. Then he resumed his recitation. A little while afterwards, he stopped and called, Don't take it all. I need some to pay taxes with tomorrow. The intruder gathered up most of the money and started to leave. Thank a person when you receive a gift, Shichiri added. The man thanked him and made off. A few days afterwards, the fellow was caught and confessed, among others, the offense against Shichiri. When Shichiri was called as a witness, he said, This man is no thief, at least as far as I am concerned. I gave him money, and he thanked me for it. After he had finished his prison term, the man went to Shichiri and became his disciple. Circumflex. In a modern world often governed by fear and suspicion, this story imparts a profound lesson on the transformative power of compassion and understanding over aggression and greed. Shichiri Kojun's response to a threatening situation by offering kindness instead of resistance illustrates a radical approach to conflict resolution. By treating the thief with dignity and trust, he not only averted potential harm, but also ignited a change within the thief, leading him to reconsider his actions and ultimately seek redemption. This narrative encourages us to reconsider our instincts towards defensiveness and retaliation, proposing that empathy and generosity can inspire profound changes in others and foster a more harmonious society. 45. Right and Wrong When Bankai held his seclusion weeks of meditation, pupils from many parts of Japan came to attend. During one of these gatherings, a pupil was caught stealing. The matter was reported to Bankai with the request that the culprit be expelled. Banke ignored the case. Later, the pupil was caught in a similar act, and again, Banke disregarded the matter. This angered the other pupils, who drew up a petition asking for the dismissal of the thief, stating that otherwise they would leave in a body. When Banke had read the petition, he called everyone before him. You are wise brothers, he told them. You know what is right and what is not right. You may go somewhere else to study if you wish, but this poor brother does not even know right from wrong. Who will teach him if I do not? I am going to keep him here even if all the rest of you leave. A torrent of tears cleansed the face of the brother who had stolen. All desire to steal had vanished. Circumflex. In Banke's story, we learn the power of compassion over punishment. Instead of expelling the thief, Bankai's forgiveness transforms him, teaching us that understanding and empathy can lead to true change. This lesson is vital in today's world, where quick judgments often overlook the potential for personal growth and redemption. Through patience and compassion, we can help others find their way, fostering a more forgiving and inclusive society. 46. How Grass and Trees Become Enlightened During the Kamakura period, Shinkan studied Tendai six years and then studied Zen seven years. Then he went to China and contemplated Zen for 13 years more. When he returned to Japan, many desired to interview him and asked obscure questions. But when Shinkan received visitors, which was infrequently, he seldom answered their questions. One day, a 50-year-old student of enlightenment said to Shinkan, I have studied the Tendai school of thought since I was a little boy, but one thing in it I cannot understand. Tendai claims that even the grass and trees will become enlightened. To me, this seems very strange. Of what use is it to discuss how grass and trees become enlightened? asked Shinkan. The question is how you yourself can become so. 
Did you even consider that? I never thought of it that way, marveled the old man. Then go home and think it over, finished Shinkan. Circumflex. In the story, Shinkan emphasizes personal enlightenment over intellectual curiosity about the world, underscoring a significant modern life lesson. Focus on self-improvement and understanding one's own path to enlightenment, rather than being overly concerned with external or theoretical concepts. This narrative teaches the importance of introspection and personal growth, encouraging individuals to prioritize their own spiritual and intellectual journeys in a world often distracted by the superficial or the external. It highlights the value of direct experience and personal insight over theoretical knowledge, suggesting that true wisdom comes from understanding oneself and one's place in the world. 47. The Stingy Artist Gessen was an artist monk. Before he would start a drawing or painting, he always insisted upon being paid in advance, and his fees were high. He was known as the Stingy Artist. A geisha once gave him a commission for a painting. How much can you pay? inquired Gessen. Whatever you charge, replied the girl, but I want you to do the work in front of me. So on a certain day, Gessen was called by the geisha. She was holding a feast for her patron. Gessen, with fine brushwork, did the painting. When it was completed, he asked the highest sum of his time. He received his pay. Then the geisha turned to her patron, saying, All this artist wants is money. His paintings are fine, but his mind is dirty. Money has caused it to become muddy. Drawn by such a filthy mind, his work is not fit to exhibit. It is just about good enough for one of my petticoats. Removing her skirt, she then asked Gessen to do another picture on the back of her petticoat. How much will you pay? asked Gessen. Oh, any amount, answered the girl. Gessen named a fancy price, painted the picture in the manner requested, and went away. It was learned later that Gessen had these reasons for desiring money. A ravaging famine often visited his province. The rich would not help the poor, so Gessen had a secret warehouse, unknown to anyone, which he kept filled with grain, prepared for these emergencies. From his village to the national shrine, the road was in very poor condition, and many travelers suffered while traversing it. He desired to build a better road. His teacher had passed away without realizing his wish to build a temple, and Gessen wished to complete this temple for him. After Gessen had accomplished his three wishes, he threw away his brushes and artist's materials and, retiring to the mountains, never painted again. Circumflex In this tale, Gessen, known as the Stingy Artist, teaches a profound lesson relevant to our modern lives. Despite criticism for his apparent greed, his motives were altruistic, aiming to alleviate famine, improve travel, and honor his mentor by building a temple. This story illustrates that judgments based solely on outward actions can be misleading. The true intentions behind one's actions are what define their character and impact. In an era where quick judgments are common, it's a reminder to look deeper, recognizing that noble goals can lie behind seemingly selfish acts. 48. Accurate Proportion Sen no Rikyu, a tea master, wished to hang a flower basket on a column. He asked a carpenter to help him, directing the man to place it a little higher or lower, to the right or left, until he had found exactly the right spot. That's the place, said Sen no Rikya finally. The carpenter, to test the master, marked the spot and then pretended he had forgotten. Was this the place? Was this the place, perhaps? The carpenter kept asking, pointing to various places on the column. But so accurate was the tea master's sense of proportion that it was not until the carpenter reached the identical spot again that its location was approved. Circumflex. In a fast-paced world, patience and attention to detail are increasingly overlooked, 
yet they hold profound significance. Sen no Rikyu's meticulous determination in finding the perfect spot for the flower basket symbolizes the importance of precision and mindfulness in all endeavors. This story teaches modern society the value of taking time to achieve perfection, highlighting that the pursuit of excellence, no matter how minor the task may seem, requires patience, attention, and a keen sense of judgment. It reminds us that in the rush of everyday life, taking a moment to focus on the details can lead to more meaningful and fulfilling outcomes. 49. Black-Nosed Buddha A nun who was searching for enlightenment made a statue of Buddha and covered it with gold leaf. Wherever she went, she carried this golden Buddha with her. Years passed, and still carrying her Buddha, the nun came to live in a small temple in a country where there were many Buddhas, each one with its own particular shrine. The nun wished to burn incense before her golden Buddha. Not liking the idea of the perfume straying to others, she devised a funnel through which the smoke would ascend only to her statue. This blackened the nose of the golden Buddha, making it especially ugly. Circumflex. In modern life, this story teaches the folly of selfishness and the unintended consequences of trying to hoard goodness or beauty for oneself. The nun's attempt to keep the incense's benefits solely for her Buddha ended up tarnishing its appearance. It's a reminder that trying to isolate blessings or positivity can lead to negative outcomes. Sharing and openness can enhance the value of what we hold dear rather than diminishing it. This story encourages us to think beyond our narrow interests and consider the broader impact of our actions on our community and the world around us. 50. Ryanin's Clear Realization The Buddhist nun known as Ryanin was born in 1797. She was a granddaughter of the famous Japanese warrior Shingen. Her poetical genius and alluring beauty were such that at 17 she was serving the empress as one of the ladies of the court. Even at such a youthful age, fame awaited her. The beloved empress died suddenly, and Ryanin's hopeful dreams vanished. She became acutely aware of the impermanency of life in this world. It was then that she desired to study Zen. Her relatives disagreed, however, and practically forced her into marriage. With a promise that she might become a nun after she had borne three children, Ryanin assented. Before she was twenty-five, she had accomplished this condition. Then her husband and relatives could no longer dissuade her from her desire. She shaved her head, took the name of Ryanin, which means to realize clearly, and started on her pilgrimage. She came to the city of Edo and asked Tetsugya to accept her as a disciple. At one glance, the master rejected her because she was too beautiful. Ryanin went to another master, Hakuo. Hakuo refused her for the same reason, saying that her beauty would only make trouble. Ryanin obtained a hot iron and placed it against her face. In a few moments, her beauty had vanished forever. Hakuo then accepted her as a disciple. Commemorating this occasion, Ryanin wrote a poem on the back of a little mirror. In the service of my empress, I burned incense to perfume my exquisite clothes. Now, as a homeless mendicant, I burned my face to enter a Zen temple. When Ryanin was about to pass from this world, she wrote another poem. Sixty-six times have these eyes beheld the changing scene of autumn. I have said enough about moonlight. Ask no more. Only listen to the voice of pines and cedars when no wind stirs. Circumflex Ryanin's story highlights the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment over worldly desires and the impermanence of physical beauty. Her transformation from a court lady to a Zen nun reflects a profound understanding of life's transient nature and the deep yearning for inner peace and clarity. In modern life, her tale is a powerful reminder to look beyond superficial appearances and societal expectations focusing instead on personal growth, resilience, and the pursuit of genuine fulfillment. 
This narrative encourages embracing life's challenges as opportunities for spiritual and personal development, urging us to find beauty in the impermanent and the spiritual over the material. 51. Sour Miso The cook monk Dairyo at Bangke's monastery decided that he would take good care of his old teacher's health and give him only fresh miso, a paste of soybeans mixed with wheat and yeast that often ferments. Bangke, noticing that he was being served better miso than his pupils, asked, Who is the cook today? Dairyo was sent before him. Banquet learned that according to his age and position, he should eat only fresh miso. So he said to the cook, Then you think I shouldn't eat at all? With this, he entered his room and locked the door. Dario, sitting outside the door, asked his teacher's pardon. Banquet would not answer. For seven days, Dario sat outside and Banquet within. Finally, in desperation, an adherent called loudly to Banquet. You may be all right, old teacher, but this young disciple here has to eat. He cannot go without food forever. At that, Banke opened the door. He was smiling. He told Dario, I insist on eating the same food as the least of my followers. When you become the teacher, I do not want you to forget this. The cook monk Dario at Banke's monastery decided that he would take good care of his old teacher's health and give him only fresh miso, a paste of soybeans mixed with wheat and yeast that often ferments. Banke, noticing that he was being served better miso than his pupils, asked, Who is the cook today? Dario was sent before him. Banke learned that according to his age and position, he should eat only fresh miso. So he said to the cook, then you think I shouldn't eat at all. With this, he entered his room and locked the door. Dario, sitting outside the door, asked his teacher's pardon. Banke would not answer. For seven days, Dario sat outside and Banke within. Finally, in desperation, an adherent called loudly to Banke. You may be all right, old teacher, but this young disciple here has to eat. He cannot go without food forever. At that, Banke opened the door. He was smiling. He told Dario, I insist on eating the same food as the least of my followers. When you become the teacher, I do not want you to forget this. 52. Your light may go out. A student of Tendai, a philosophical school of Buddhism, came to the Zen abode of Gassan as a pupil. When he was departing a few years later, Ghassan warned him, Studying the truth speculatively is useful as a way of collecting preaching material. But remember that unless you meditate constantly, you light of truth may go out. Circumflex In this lesson, Ghassan imparts a crucial message applicable to modern life the importance of consistent practice and internalization over merely accumulating knowledge. It suggests that understanding or enlightenment, whether in spirituality, personal development, or any area of life, requires more than just theoretical study. True wisdom and insight come from continuous reflection and application. In today's fast-paced world, where information is abundant but often superficially engaged with, Gasson's advice reminds us that deep, transformative learning necessitates a committed and meditative approach to truly illuminate the path of truth in our lives. 53. The Giver Should Be Thankful While Sayatsu was the master of Engaku and Kamakura, he required larger quarters since those in which he was teaching were overcrowded. Umeza Saibe, a merchant of Edo, decided to donate 500 pieces of gold called Rio toward the construction of a more commodious school. This money he brought to the teacher. Saisetsu said, All right, I will take it. Umezu gave Saisetsu the sack of gold, but he was dissatisfied with the attitude of the teacher. One might live a whole year on three Rio, and the merchant had not even been thanked for 500. In that sack are 500 Rio, hinted Umeza. 
You told me that before, replied Seisetsu. Even if I am a wealthy merchant, 500 ryo is a lot of money, said Umezu. Do you want me to thank you for it? asked Seisetsu. You ought to, replied Umeza. Why should I? inquired Seisetsu. The giver should be thankful. Circumflex Saisetsu's response to Umeza's donation teaches a profound lesson relevant to modern Americans. True generosity doesn't seek recognition. In today's society where social media often turns acts of kindness into opportunities for self-promotion, this story reminds us to give selflessly. It suggests that the act of giving enriches the giver, making gratitude a two-way street. This mindset fosters a culture of humility and genuine generosity, where the focus shifts from seeking appreciation to appreciating the opportunity to help others and make a positive impact. 54. The Last Will and Testament Ikyu, a famous Zen teacher of the Ashikaga era, was the son of the emperor. When he was very young, his mother left the palace and went to study Zen in a temple. In this way, Prince Ikyu also became a student. When this mother passed on, she left him a letter. It read, To Ikyu, I have finished my work in this life and am now returning into eternity. I wish you to become a good student and to realize your Buddha nature. You will know if I am in hell and whether I am always with you or not. If you become a man who realizes that the Buddha and his follower Bodhidharma are your own servants, you may leave off studying and work for humanity. The Buddha preached for 49 years and in all that time found it not necessary to speak one word. You ought to know why, but if you don't and yet wish to, avoid thinking fruitlessly. Your mother, not born, not dead. September 1st. P.S. The teaching of Buddha was mainly for the purpose of enlightening others. If you are dependent on any of its methods, you are naught but an ignorant insect. There are 80,000 books on Buddhism, and if you should read all of them and still not see your own nature, you will not understand even this letter. This is my will and testament, circumflex. In this tale, E.Q. learns a profound lesson about the essence of enlightenment and the impermanence of life. His mother's letter transcends traditional teachings, emphasizing that true wisdom isn't found in texts or teachings, but in the realization of one's inherent Buddha nature. This story highlights the importance of self-discovery and compassion in modern life, urging us to look beyond superficial knowledge and understand the deeper meaning of existence. It teaches that enlightenment and understanding come from within, not from external sources or dogmatic adherence to religious texts. This lesson is vital in today's world, where information is abundant but true understanding is rare. It encourages a journey towards self-awareness and serving humanity with humility. 55. The Tea Master and the Assassin Taiko, a warrior who lived in Japan before the Tokugawa era, studied Cha no Yu, tea etiquette, with Sen no Rikyu, a teacher of that aesthetical expression of calmness and contentment. Taiko's attendant warrior, Kato, interpreted his superior's enthusiasm for tea etiquette as negligence of state affairs, so he decided to kill Sen no Rikyu. He pretended to make a social call upon the tea master and was invited to drink tea. The master, who was well skilled in his art, saw at a glance the warrior's intention, so he invited Cato to leave his sword outside before entering the room for the ceremony, explaining that Cha no Yu represents peacefulness itself. Cato would not listen to this. I am a warrior, he said. I always have my sword with me. Cha no Yu or no Cha no Yu, I have my sword. Very well, bring your sword in and have some tea consented Sen no Rikyu. The kettle was boiling on the charcoal fire. Suddenly, Sen no Rikyu tipped it over. Hissing steam arose, filling the room with smoke and ashes. The startled warrior ran outside. 
The tea master apologized. It was my mistake. Come back in and have some tea. I have your sword here covered with ashes and will clean it and give it to you. In this predicament, the warrior realized he could not very well kill the tea master, so he gave up the idea. Circumflex. In a world where efficiency and quick judgments often overshadow deeper values, the story of Tycho, Sen no Rikyu, and Cato reminds us of the importance of mindfulness and the pursuit of peace over conflict. The tea ceremony, an embodiment of tranquility and respect, serves as a metaphor for how patience and understanding can disarm aggression and transform intentions. This lesson is particularly relevant in modern society, where the pace of life and the prevalence of conflict can eclipse the value of slowing down, appreciating the moment, and prioritizing harmony over discord. By embracing the principles of Cha No Yu, we are encouraged to seek peaceful resolutions and foster a culture of respect and mindfulness in our interactions, reflecting on how ancient wisdom can guide contemporary life. 56. The True Path Just before Ninakawa passed away, the Zen master, Ikyu, visited him. Shall I lead you on? Ikyu asked. Ninakawa replied, I came here alone and I go alone. What help could you be to me? Ikyu answered, If you think you really come and go, that is your delusion. Let me show you the path on which there is no coming and going. With his words, Ikyu had revealed the path so clearly that Ninakawa smiled and passed away, circumflex. In a serene setting as Ninakawa's life wanes, Zen master Ikyu offers guidance, symbolizing spiritual support. Ninakawa's independence underscores life's solitary journey, but Ikyu challenges this view, introducing the concept of non-duality, life and death as interconnected, transcending individual existence. Their exchange illuminates the eternal cycle, urging modern individuals to see beyond the material, recognizing life's interconnected essence. This teaches us to embrace life's transience, finding peace in the impermanent, a relevant lesson in today's fast-paced world where mindfulness and spiritual connectivity offer solace amidst chaos. 57. The Gates of Paradise a soldier named Nobushige came to Hakuin and asked, Is there really a paradise and a hell? Who are you? inquired Hakuin. I am a samurai, the warrior replied. You, a soldier, exclaimed Hakuin. What kind of ruler would have you as his guard? Your face looks like that of a beggar. Nobushige became so angry that he began to draw his sword. But Hakuin continued, so you have a sword. Your weapon is probably much too dull to cut off my head. As Nobushiga drew his sword, Hakuin remarked, Here open the gates of hell. At these words, the samurai, perceiving the master's discipline, sheathed his sword and bowed. Here open the gates of paradise, said Hakuin. In this story, a samurai learns from Hakuin that heaven and hell are states of mind, shaped by our reactions and emotions. The lesson underscores the power of self-control and perception in modern life, teaching that our responses to challenges can either create conflict or foster peace and understanding. This wisdom is particularly relevant today, where quick judgments and reactions often escalate situations unnecessarily. By mastering our emotions and reactions, we can navigate life more peacefully and meaningfully, choosing constructive over destructive paths. 58. Arresting the Stone Buddha A merchant bearing fifty rolls of cotton goods on his shoulders stopped to rest from the heat of the day beneath a shelter where a large stone Buddha was standing. There he fell asleep, and when he awoke, his goods had disappeared. He immediately reported the matter to the police. A judge named Ooka opened court to investigate. That stone Buddha must have stolen the goods, concluded the judge. 
He is supposed to care for the welfare of the people, but he has failed to perform his holy duty. Arrest him. The police arrested the stone Buddha and carried it into the court. A noisy crowd followed the statue, curious to learn what kind of sentence the judge was about to impose. When O.O.K. appeared on the bench, he rebuked the boisterous audience. What right have you people to appear before the court laughing and joking in this manner? You are in contempt of court and subject to a fine and imprisonment. The people hastened to apologize. I shall have to impose a fine on you, said the judge, but I will remit it provided each one of you brings one roll of cotton goods to the court within three days. Anyone failing to do this will be arrested. One of the rolls of cloth which the people brought was quickly recognized by the merchant as his own, and thus the thief was easily discovered. The merchant recovered his goods, and the cotton rolls were returned to the people, circumflex. In a modern world where the pace of life is ever accelerating, this story illustrates the timeless value of creativity in problem solving and the importance of community involvement. The judge's unconventional method of solving the crime by implicating the stone Buddha not only sparked the community's engagement, but also led to a collective effort to rectify the wrongdoing. This reflects the idea that innovative approaches, coupled with communal cooperation, can effectively address issues and restore harmony. The narrative underscores the significance of looking beyond conventional methods and the power of unity in overcoming challenges, a lesson particularly relevant in today's society where collaboration and out-of-the-box thinking are pivotal to navigating complexities. So, 59. Soldiers of Humanity Once a division of the Japanese army was engaged in a sham battle, and some of the officers found it necessary to make their headquarters in Gassen's temple. Gassen told his cook, Let the officers have only the same simple fare we eat. This made the army men angry, as they are used to very deferential treatment. One came to Gassen and said, Who do you think we are? We are soldiers, sacrificing our lives for our country. Why don't you treat us accordingly? Gassen answered sternly, who do you think we are? We are soldiers of humanity, aiming to save all sentient beings. In a Japanese temple, a Zen master served humble meals to officers sparking outrage. They demanded special treatment, but the master retorted, asserting they too were warriors, but for humanity's salvation. This teaches equality and humility emphasizing life's intrinsic value over societal status, a vital reminder in today's status-driven world. It underscores the importance of serving greater causes beyond personal or professional identities, advocating for universal compassion and understanding across all walks of life. 60. The Tunnel Zenkai, the son of a samurai, journeyed to Edo and there became the retainer of a high official. He fell in love with the official's wife and was discovered. In self-defense, he slew the official. Then he ran away with the wife. Both of them later became thieves, but the woman was so greedy that Zenkai grew disgusted. Finally, leaving her, he journeyed far away to the province of Buzin, where he became a wandering mendicant. To atone for his past, Zenkai resolved to accomplish some good deed in his lifetime. Knowing of a dangerous road over a cliff that had caused death and injury to many persons, he resolved to cut a tunnel through the mountain there. Begging food in the daytime, Zenkai worked at night digging his tunnel. When thirty years had gone by, the tunnel was 2,280 feet long, twenty feet high, and thirty feet wide. Two years before the work was completed, the son of the official he had slain, who was a skillful swordsman, found Zenkai out and came to kill him in revenge. I will give you my life willingly, said Zenkai. Only let me finish this work. On the day it is completed, then you may kill me. So the son awaited the day. 
Several months passed and Zenkai kept digging. The son grew tired of doing nothing and began to help with the digging. After he had helped for more than a year, he came to admire Zenkai's strong will and character. At last, the tunnel was completed and the people could use it and travel safely. Now cut off my head, said Zenkai. My work is done. How can I cut off my own teacher's head? asked the younger man with tears in his eyes. Zenkai's story teaches the power of redemption and transformation. Even those who've made grave mistakes can change and contribute positively to society. Zenkai, a former samurai turned thief, seeks redemption by constructing a tunnel that saves lives, dedicating decades to this selfless task. His journey from criminal to benefactor demonstrates that one's past does not dictate their future. Importantly, it shows that through perseverance and a desire to make amends, individuals can indeed make a significant impact. Furthermore, the story highlights forgiveness and the potential for understanding, as seen when the official's son, initially seeking revenge, ends up assisting Zenkai. This act of coming together to complete the tunnel not only symbolizes personal redemption, but also the reconciliation and healing of past grievances. In today's world, where mistakes and grudges can be amplified, Zenkai's tale reminds us of the importance of forgiveness, the possibility of change, and the impact of working towards a common good. 61. Gudo and the Emperor. The Emperor Goyose was studying Zen under Gudo. He inquired, In Zen, this very mind is Buddha. Is this correct? Gudo answered, If I say yes, you will think that you understand without understanding. If I say no, I would be contradicting a fact which you may understand quite well. On another day, the Emperor asked Gudo, where does the enlightened man go when he dies? Gudo answered, I know not. Why don't you know? asked the emperor. Because I have not died yet, replied Gudo. The emperor hesitated to inquire further about these things his mind could not grasp. So Gudo beat the floor with his hand as if to awaken him, and the emperor was enlightened. The emperor respected Zen and old Gudo more than ever after his enlightenment and he even permitted Gudo to wear his hat in the palace in winter. When Gudo was over 80, he used to fall asleep in the midst of his lecture, and the emperor would quietly retire to another room so his beloved teacher might enjoy the rest his aging body required. Circumflex In a modern world brimming with information and constant search for concrete answers, this Zen narrative underscores the value of embracing uncertainty and the journey of personal enlightenment. It teaches us the importance of experiential understanding and the limitations of intellectual comprehension alone. The story illustrates that true wisdom often lies beyond conventional knowledge, encouraging a mindset of openness and humility. The interactions between Emperor Goyose and Gudo highlight the significance of acknowledging what we don't know, and that sometimes not having an answer is a profound answer itself. This lesson is vital in an era where the quest for immediate clarity often overshadows the deeper pursuit of meaningful insight. 62. In the Hands of Destiny a great Japanese warrior named Nobunaga decided to attack the enemy although he had only one-tenth the number of men the opposition commanded. He knew that he would win, but his soldiers were in doubt. On the way, he stopped at a Shinto shrine and told his men, After I visit the shrine, I will toss a coin. If heads comes, we will win. If tails, we will lose. Destiny holds us in her hand. Nobunaga entered the shrine and offered a silent prayer. He came forth and tossed a coin. Heads appeared. His soldiers were so eager to fight that they won their battle easily. No one can change the hand of destiny, his attendant told him after the battle. Indeed not, said Nobunaga, showing a coin which had been doubled with heads facing either way. Circumflex 
In this story, the legendary Japanese warrior Nobunaga teaches a valuable lesson about leadership, belief, and the power of perception in modern life. He cleverly uses a coin with heads on both sides to guarantee a psychological victory for his troops, showcasing the critical role of confidence and morale in achieving success. Despite facing overwhelming odds, Nobunaga's strategy underscores the importance of mental strength and positive thinking. In today's world, where uncertainty and challenges are rampant, this tale reminds us that often our mindset and beliefs can significantly influence the outcomes of our endeavors. It suggests that sometimes creating the belief in victory can be as crucial as the victory itself. 63. Killing. Ghassan instructed his adherents one day, Those who speak against killing and who desire to spare the lives of all conscious beings are right. It is good to protect even animals and insects. But what about those persons who kill time? What about those who are destroying wealth and those who destroy political economy? We should not overlook them. Furthermore, what of the one who preaches without enlightenment? He is killing Buddhism. In today's fast-paced world, Ghassan's teachings remind us of the value of time, resources, and true understanding. He challenges us to think beyond the literal act of killing, urging us to consider the broader implications of our actions on time, wealth, and societal structures. Wasting time, mismanaging resources, and spreading ignorance are seen as forms of destruction that can be as harmful as physical violence. Ghassan's message encourages mindfulness in how we live, utilize our resources, and share knowledge. He advocates for a holistic approach to nonviolence that encompasses not only the preservation of life, but also the protection of our collective future and enlightenment. 64. Kassan Sweat Kassan was asked to officiate at the funeral of a provincial lord. He had never met lords and nobles before, so he was nervous. When the ceremony started, Kassan sweat. Afterwards, when he had returned, he gathered his pupils together. Kassan confessed that he was not yet qualified to be a teacher, for he lacked the sameness of bearing in the world of fame that he possessed in the secluded temple. Then Kassan resigned and became a pupil of another master. Eight years later, he returned to his former pupils, enlightened, circumflex. In a world that idolizes success and public recognition, the story of Kassan teaches a profound lesson. Despite the honor of officiating a noble's funeral, Kassan felt inadequate due to his nervousness and lack of composure. This humility led him to step down and seek further enlightenment. In our modern lives, filled with constant pressure to perform and impress, Kassan's journey reminds us that True growth often requires humility, self-reflection, and the courage to acknowledge our limitations. It champions the idea that personal development and enlightenment are lifelong processes, encouraging us to embrace our vulnerabilities and continuously seek improvement. 65. The Subjugation of a Ghost A young wife fell sick and was about to die. I love you so much, she told her husband. I do not want to leave you. Do not go from me to any other woman. If you do, I will return as a ghost and cause you endless trouble. Soon, the wife passed away. The husband respected her last wish for the first three months, but then he met another woman and fell in love with her. They became engaged to be married. Immediately after the engagement, a ghost appeared every night to the man blaming him for not keeping his promise. The ghost was clever, too. She told him exactly what has transpired between himself and his new sweetheart. Whenever he gave his fiancée a present, the ghost would describe it in detail. She would even repeat conversations, and it so annoyed the man that he could not sleep. Someone advised him to take his problem to a Zen master who lived close to the village. At length, in despair, the poor man went to him for help. 
Your former wife became a ghost and knows everything you do, commented the master. Whatever you do or say, whatever you give you beloved, she knows. She must be a very wise ghost. Really, you should admire such a ghost. The next time she appears, bargain with her. Tell her that she knows so much you can hide nothing from her, and that if she will answer you one question, you promise to break your engagement and remain single. What is the question I must ask her? inquired the man. The master replied, Take a large handful of soybeans and ask her exactly how many beans you hold in your hand. If she cannot tell you, you will know she is only a figment of your imagination and will trouble you no longer. The next night when the ghost appeared, the man flattered her and told her that she knew everything. Indeed, replied the ghost, and I know you went to see that Zen master today. And since you know so much, demanded the man, tell me how many beans I hold in this hand. There was no longer any ghost to answer the question. Circumflex. In The Subjugation of a Ghost, a tale unfolds about love, loss, and the power of letting go. When a young wife dies, she vows to haunt her husband if he moves on, which he eventually does. The haunting begins, but with the guidance of a Zen master, the husband learns an important lesson. By challenging the ghost on a task she couldn't complete, he realizes she's a manifestation of his guilt and fear. This story symbolizes the importance of facing our inner demons and the fact that our fears often hold us back more than reality does. In modern life, it reminds us that holding on to the past can prevent us from moving forward and finding peace. It's a lesson on the importance of confronting our fears, understanding our emotions, and the need to let go of what no longer serves us to embrace the present and future. 66. Children of His Majesty Yamaoka Teshu was a tutor of the emperor. He was also a master of fencing and a profound student of Zen. His home was the abode of vagabonds. He has but one suit of clothes, for they kept him always poor. The emperor, observing how worn his garments were, gave Yamaoka some money to buy new ones. The next time Yamaoka appeared, he wore the same old outfit. What became of the new clothes, Yamaoka? asked the emperor. I provided clothes for the children of your majesty, explained Yamaoka. Circumflex. In modern life, Yamaoka Teshu's story highlights the value of selflessness and prioritizing the needs of others over material possessions. Despite his close association with the emperor and personal achievements, Yamaoka chose to help those in need rather than indulge in personal luxury. This lesson underscores the importance of compassion and generosity, reminding us that true fulfillment and respect are earned not by what we possess, but by how we choose to impact the lives of others around us. 67. What are you doing? What are you saying? In modern times, a great deal of nonsense is talked about masters and disciples and about the inheritance of a master's teaching by favorite pupils, entitling them to pass the truth on to their adherents. Of course, Zen should be imparted in this way, from heart to heart, and in the past, it was really accomplished. Silence and humility reigned rather than profession and assertion. The one who received such a teaching kept the matter hidden even after twenty years. Not until another discovered through his own need that a real master was at hand was it learned that the teaching had been imparted, and even then the occasion arose quite naturally, and the teaching made its way in its own right. Under no circumstance did the teacher even claim, I am the successor of so-and-so. Such a claim would prove quite the contrary. The Zen master Munan had only one successor. His name was Shoju. After Shoju had completed his study of Zen, Munan called him into his room. I am getting old, he said, and as far as I know, Shoju, you are the only one who will carry on this teaching. Here is a book. 
It has been passed down from master to master for seven generations. I have also added many points according to my understanding. The book is very valuable, and I am giving it to you to represent your successorship. If the book is such an important thing, you had better keep it, Shoju replied. I received your Zen without writing, and am satisfied with it as it is. I know that, said Munan. Even so, this work has been carried from master to master for seven generations, so you may keep it as a symbol of having received the teaching. Here. They happened to be talking before a brazier. The instant Shoju felt the book in his hands, he thrust it into the flaming coals. He had no lust for possessions. Munan, who never had been angry before, yelled, What are you doing? Shoju shouted back, What are you saying? Circumflex. In an era where authenticity and personal connection often yield to digital noise, the story of Munan and Shoju offers a compelling lesson. True wisdom and knowledge, as exemplified by Zen teachings, cannot be confined to mere objects or traditional succession. Instead, they flourish through personal experience, understanding, and the internalization of principles. Shoju's rejection of the physical book, a symbol of succession, underscores the essence of learning. It's not the possession of knowledge that matters, but the depth of understanding and its application in life. This narrative reminds us that in our fast-paced, information-saturated world, Genuine insight and wisdom come from lived experience and personal discovery, not from the accumulation of material or titles. 68. One Note of Zen After Kakua visited the emperor, he disappeared and no one knew what became of him. He was the first Japanese to study Zen in China, but since he showed nothing of it save one note, he is not remembered for having brought Zen into his country. Kakua visited China and accepted the true teaching. He did not travel while he was there. Meditating constantly, he lived on a remote part of a mountain. Whenever people found him and asked him to preach, he would say a few words and then move to another part of the mountain where he could be found less easily. The emperor heard about Kakua when he returned to Japan and asked him to preach Zen for his edification and that of his subjects. Kakua stood before the emperor in silence. He the produced a flute from the folds of his robe and blew one short note. Bowing politely, he disappeared. Circumflex Kakua's story teaches the value of introspection and the personal nature of enlightenment. In a modern world filled with noise and distraction, it highlights the importance of silence and the internal quest for truth. Unlike seeking external validation or acclaim, Kakua's journey underscores finding peace and wisdom within oneself. His silent message to the emperor embodies the essence of Zen. Enlightenment transcends words and is deeply personal, a lesson increasingly relevant in today's society. 69. Eating the Blame Circumstances arose one day which delayed preparation of the dinner of a Soto Zen master, Fukai, and his followers. In haste, the cook went to the garden with his curved knife and cut off the tops of green vegetables, chopped them together, and made soup, unaware that, in his haste, he had included a part of a snake in the vegetables. The followers of Fugai thought they never tasted such good soup, but when the master himself found the snake's head in his bowl, he summoned the cook. What is this? he demanded, holding you the head of the snake. Oh, thank you, master, replied the cook, taking the morsel and eating it quickly. Circumflex. In a world often rushing toward outcomes, this tale underscores the virtue of mindfulness and acceptance. Even amidst the haste of daily tasks, it prompts us to consider the importance of being present and thorough in our actions. The cook's response exemplifies an embrace of circumstances, no matter how unexpected, reflecting a profound lesson on adaptability and the embrace of life's surprises. 
This story resonates in modern life, reminding us that amidst the chaos, there lies an opportunity for growth and learning if we approach it with an open heart and mind. 70. The Most Valuable Thing in the World Sozon, a Chinese Zen master, was asked by a student, What is the most valuable thing in the world? The master replied, The head of a dead cat. Why is the head of a dead cat the most valuable thing in the world? inquired the student. Sozon replied, Because no one can name its price. Circumflex In modern life, where value is often quantified by market price or utility, Sozan's lesson stands out. He suggests that true value is beyond the materialistic and quantifiable. The head of a dead cat represents something of no conventional value, yet it is deemed the most valuable because it transcends monetary evaluation. This paradox encourages us to find worth in the intangible, love, experiences, knowledge, which truly enrich our lives beyond what money can buy. It's a call to appreciate the invaluable aspects of life that cannot be priced or owned. 71. A Cup of Tea Nan In, a Japanese master during the Meiji era, 1868-1912, received a university professor who came to inquire about Zen. Nan In served tea. He poured his visitor's cup full and then kept on pouring. The professor watched the overflow until he no longer could restrain himself. It is overfull. No more will go in. Like this cup, Nan In said, you are full of your own opinions and speculations. How can I show you Zen unless you first empty your cup? Master asked, How does it taste? Young man replied, It's terrible. All I could taste was salt. Now, Master asked that young man to take a handful of salt and come with him. They both went to nearby lake. Master said, Now put this salt in the lake. Young man swirled his handful of salt into the lake. After this, Master asked him to drink water from the lake. Young man took some water and drank. Now Master asked, How does it taste? Young man replied, It tastes good. Master questioned again, Were you able to taste salt in this water? Young man replied, No. Master and young man sat near that lake. Master took his hands and said, The pain of life is pure salt, no more, no less. The amount of pain in life remains the same, but the amount we taste the pain depends on the container we put it into. So when you are in pain, the only thing you can do is to enlarge your sense of things. Stop being a glass. Become a lake. In a world overwhelmed by opinions and information, the story of Nan In and the overflowing teacup teaches us the importance of openness and the willingness to unlearn making space for new insights. Similarly, the lesson of the salt in the lake illustrates that the magnitude of life's challenges doesn't change, but our capacity to handle them does. By expanding our perspectives and embracing a broader understanding of life, we can dilute the bitterness of adversity, allowing us to taste the richness of experiences without being overwhelmed by the saltiness of hardships. These stories remind us to approach life with humility and adaptability, emphasizing the value of perspective in navigating the complexities of modern existence. 72. The Blockhead Lord Two Zen teachers, Daigu and Gudo, were invited to visit a lord. Upon arriving, Gudo said to the lord, You are wise by nature and have an inborn ability to learn Zen. Nonsense, said Daigu. Why do you flatter this blockhead? He may be a lord, but he doesn't know anything of Zen. So, instead of building a temple for Gudo, the lord built it for Daigu and studied Zen with him. In modern life, this story suggests that genuine progress and enlightenment come not from flattery or inherent status, but through challenge and humility. Acknowledging our limitations, 
opens the path to true learning and growth. Daigu's blunt honesty, contrasting with Gudo's flattery, highlights the value of sincerity and the transformative power of facing uncomfortable truths. This narrative encourages embracing humility and striving for genuine understanding rather than settling for superficial praise or resting on one's laurels. It's a call to actively seek truth and wisdom, regardless of our initial level of knowledge or social standing. 73. Ten Successors Zen pupils take a vow that even if they are killed by their teacher, they intend to learn Zen. Usually they cut a finger and seal their resolution with blood. In time, the vow has become a mere formality, and for this reason the pupil who died by the hand of Ekido was made to appear a martyr. Ekido had become a severe teacher. His pupils feared him. One of them on duty, striking the gong to tell the time of day, missed his beats when his eye was attracted by a beautiful girl passing the temple gate. At that moment, Ekido, who was directly behind him, hit him with a stick and the shock happened to kill him. The pupil's guardian, hearing of the accident, went directly to Ekido. Knowing that he was not to blame, he praised the master for his severe teaching. Ekido's attitude was just the same as if the pupil were still alive. After this took place, he was able to produce under his guidance more than ten enlightened successors, a very unusual number. Circumflex the story illustrates the profound dedication required in the journey of learning and personal growth. In a modern context, it highlights the importance of commitment, resilience, and accepting strict discipline for achieving excellence. Though the literal act of sacrificing for knowledge is extreme, it metaphorically underscores the necessity of enduring challenges and discomfort to reach enlightenment or mastery in any field. This tale also reflects on the teacher's role in shaping a student's path, emphasizing that true achievement often comes through rigorous and sometimes harsh guidance. However, it also serves as a cautionary note about the limits of strictness, suggesting that balance and understanding are key in the mentor-mentee relationship. 74. True Reformation Ryokin devoted his life to the study of Zen. One day he heard that his nephew, despite the admonitions of relatives, was spending his money on a courtesan. Inasmuch as the nephew had taken Ryokin's place in managing the family estate and the property was in danger of being dissipated, the relatives asked Ryokin to do something about it. Ryokin had to travel a long way to visit his nephew, whom he had not seen for many years. The nephew seemed pleased to meet his uncle again and invited him to remain overnight. All night Ryokin sat in meditation. As he was departing in the morning, he said to the young man, I must be getting old, my hand shakes so. Will you help me tie the string of my straw sandal? The nephew helped him willingly. Thank you, finished Ryokin. You see, a man becomes older and feebler day by day. Take good care of yourself. Then Ryokin left, never mentioning a word about the courtesan or the complaints of the relatives. But from that morning on, the dissipations of the nephew ended circumflex. Ryokin's story teaches us the power of subtlety and example over direct criticism. Instead of confronting his nephew's misconduct, he chose a moment of vulnerability to impart wisdom. This act of kindness and humility, shown through a simple request for help, reminded his nephew of life's fragility and the importance of self-care. It highlights that, often, gentle guidance can lead to profound self-reflection and change. In today's fast-paced world, this lesson underscores the value of patience, understanding, and indirect influence in fostering positive change in others. 75. Temper. A Zen student came to Benkei and complained, Master, I have an ungovernable temper. How can I cure it? You have something very strange, replied Benkei. Let me see what you have. 
Just now I cannot show it to you, replied the other. When can you show it to me? asked Bankai. It arises unexpectedly, replied the student. Then, concluded Bankai, it must not be your own true nature. If it were, you could show it to me at any time. When you were born, you did not have it, and your parents did not give it to you. Think that over. Circumflex. In a world where instant reactions can be amplified by technology, this story emphasizes the power of self-awareness and control. Bankai's lesson teaches that our true nature isn't inherently filled with negative traits like unmanageable anger. Instead, these responses are external influences that we've allowed to overtake us. By recognizing that such emotions are not integral to who we are, we gain the ability to choose how we react to the world around us. This ancient wisdom is a call to introspection and mindfulness, urging us to question the origins of our reactions and to cultivate a serene inner landscape, free from the impermanent storms of passing emotions. 76. The Stone Mind Hogan, a Chinese Zen teacher, lived alone in a small temple in the country. One day, four traveling monks appeared and asked if they might make a fire in his yard to warm themselves. While they were building the fire, Hogan heard them arguing about subjectivity and objectivity. He joined them and said, There is a big stone. Do you consider it to be inside or outside your mind? One of the monks replied, From the Buddhist viewpoint, everything is an objectification of mind, so I would say that the stone is inside my mind. Your head must feel very heavy, observed Hogan, if you are carrying around a stone like that in your mind. In a modern context, this story underscores the weight of our perceptions. Hogan's witty remark to the monk highlights how our mental models whether they deem things as internal or external to our minds, significantly impact our experience of reality. The lesson here is about mindfulness and the importance of not letting our conceptualizations and judgments become burdens. It teaches us to view our thoughts and the world around us with a lighter touch, avoiding the trap of over-intellectualization that can distance us from the simple truths of existence. Essentially, it's a call to embrace simplicity and direct experience over complex theorization, reminding us that sometimes a stone is just a stone, and that's okay. 77. No attachment to dust. Zengetsu, a Chinese master of the Tang dynasty, wrote the following advice for his pupils. Living in the world yet not forming attachments to the dust of the world is the way of a true Zen student. When witnessing the good action of another, encourage yourself to follow his example. Hearing of the mistaken action of another, advise yourself not to emulate it. Even though alone in a dark room, be as if you were facing a noble guest. Express your feelings but become no more expressive than your true nature. Poverty is your treasure. Never exchange it for an easy life. A person may appear a fool and yet not be one. He may only be guarding his wisdom carefully. Virtues are the fruit of self-discipline and do not drop from heaven of themselves as does rain or snow. Modesty is the foundation of all virtues. Let your neighbors discover you before you make yourself known to them. A noble heart never forces itself forward. Its words are as rare gems, seldom displayed and of great value. To a sincere student, every day is a fortunate day. Time passes, but he never lags behind. Neither glory nor shame can move him. Censure yourself, never another. Do not discuss right and wrong. Some things, though right, were considered wrong for generations. Since the value of righteousness may be recognized after centuries, there is no need to crave immediate appreciation. Live with cause and leave results to the great law of the universe. Pass each day in peaceful contemplation. Zengetsu's advice, stemming from the Tang dynasty, resonates deeply in modern life 
emphasizing the importance of inner peace, modesty, and self-discipline. In today's fast-paced, materialistic world, his teachings encourage us to live with purpose, not attachment, guiding us towards a life of contentment and mindfulness. By valuing virtues over material gains and focusing on personal growth rather than external approval, we foster a serene mind and a fulfilling life. Zengetsu teaches that true wisdom and happiness come from within, urging us to reflect on our actions, cultivate self-awareness, and appreciate the simplicity and beauty of life's journey. This timeless wisdom reminds us to prioritize what truly matters, offering a path to genuine contentment in an ever-changing world. 78. Real Prosperity A rich man asks Sengai to write something for the continued prosperity of his family so that it might be treasured from generation to generation. Sengai obtained a large sheet of paper and wrote, Father dies, son dies, grandson dies. The rich man became angry. I asked you to write something for the happiness of my family. Why do you make such a joke of this? No joke is intended, explained Sengai. If before you yourself die, your son should die, this would grieve you greatly. If your grandson should pass away before your son, both of you would be brokenhearted. If your family, generation after generation, passes away in the order I have named, it will be the natural course of life. I call this real prosperity. Circumflex In a modern context, Sengai's words remind us that true prosperity isn't found in wealth or possessions, but in the natural progression of life and the acceptance of its cycle. It highlights the importance of valuing each moment and the well-being of our loved ones over material gains. This perspective encourages us to cherish the time we have with our family, embracing the inevitable with grace and finding joy in the journey, not just the destination. It teaches us to prioritize emotional wealth and familial bonds, suggesting that real happiness and prosperity come from peace, acceptance, and the love we share. 79. Incense Burner A woman of Nagasaki named Kane was one of the few makers of incense burners in Japan. Such a burner is a work of art to be used only in a tea room of before a family shrine. Kane, whose father before her had been such an artist, was fond of drinking. She also smoked and associated with men most of the time. Whenever she made a little money, she gave a feast, inviting artists, poets, carpenters, workers, men of many vocations and avocations. In their association, she evolved her designs. Kame was exceedingly slow in creating, but when her work was finished, it was always a masterpiece. Her burners were treasured in homes whose womenfolk never drank, smoked, or associated freely with men. The mayor of Nagasaki once requested Kame to design an incense burner for him. She delayed doing so until almost half a year had passed. At that time, the mayor, who had been promoted to office in a distant city, visited her. He urged Kame to begin work on his burner. At last, receiving the inspiration, Kame made the incense burner. After it was completed, she placed it upon a table. She looked at it long and carefully. She smoked and drank before it as if it were her own company. All day she observed it. At last, picking up a hammer, Kame smashed it to bits. She saw it was not the perfect creation her mind demanded. Circumflex. In a world where speed and efficiency often overshadow craftsmanship and reflection, the story of Kame, a dedicated incense burner maker from Nagasaki, offers a poignant lesson. Kame's meticulous process of creation influenced by her diverse social interactions and unhurried approach, emphasizes the value of patience, diversity, and the pursuit of perfection in modern life. Despite societal pressures to conform to certain standards of behavior and productivity, Kame's journey underscores the importance of embracing one's unique process and the profound impact of dedication to artistry. 
Her final act of destroying a creation that did not meet her standards speaks to the deep commitment to excellence, reminding us that true mastery and fulfillment come not from the accolades of others, but from meeting our own highest standards. 80. The Real Miracle When Benkei was preaching at Ryomon Temple, a Shinshu priest who believed in salvation through repetition of the name of the Buddha of Love was jealous of his large audience and wanted to debate with him. Benkei was in the midst of a talk when the priest appeared, but the fellow made such a disturbance that Benkei stopped his discourse and asked about the noise. The founder of our sect, boasted the priest, had such miraculous powers that he held a brush in his hand on one bank of the river, his attendant held up a paper on the other bank, and the teacher wrote the holy name of Amida through the air. Can you do such a wonderful thing? Banquet replied lightly, Perhaps your fox can perform that trick, but that is not the manner of Zen. My miracle is that when I feel hungry I eat, and when I feel thirsty I drink. In a world obsessed with the extraordinary, Banke's teaching in modern life underscores the value of simplicity and being present. His response to the Shinshu priest challenge highlights the importance of embracing the ordinary moments of life. In contrast to seeking miraculous feats, Benkai's philosophy encourages us to find contentment and wisdom in fulfilling basic human needs and living mindfully. This lesson is particularly relevant today, where the pursuit of the sensational often overshadows the beauty and fulfillment found in the simplicity of everyday life. Bankai's message serves as a reminder to appreciate and be fully engaged in the ordinary yet profound aspects of our existence. 81. Just go to sleep. Gassen was sitting at the bedside of Tekisui three days before his teacher's passing. Tekisui had already chosen him as his successor. A temple recently had burned and Gassan was busy rebuilding the structure. Tekisui asked him, What are you going to do when you get the temple rebuilt? When your sickness is over, we want you to speak there, said Gassan. Suppose I do not live until then. Then we will get someone else, replied Gassan. Suppose you cannot find anyone, continued Tekisui. Gasan answered loudly, Don't ask such foolish questions. Just go to sleep. Circumflex In this anecdote, Gasan's practical response to his teacher Tekisui's hypothetical questions underscores a key lesson for modern life. Focus on what is immediate and actionable, rather than getting lost in endless what-ifs. Today's fast-paced, uncertain world can easily overwhelm us with countless hypotheticals and fears about the future. Gasson's approach teaches us the importance of staying grounded, addressing the present challenges, and not letting speculative worries distract us from our current tasks and responsibilities. It highlights the value of adaptability, resilience, and pragmatism in the face of uncertainty reminding us that we can deal with future problems as they arise instead of being paralyzed by them in the present. 82. Nothing Exists Yamaoka Teshu, as a young student of Zen, visited one master after another. He called upon Dokwan of Shokoku. Desiring to show his attainment, he said, The mind, Buddha, and sentient beings, after all, do not exist. The true nature of phenomena is emptiness. There is no realization, no delusion, no sage, no mediocrity. There is no giving and nothing to be received. Dokuan, who was smoking quietly, said nothing. Suddenly, he whacked Yamaoka with his bamboo pipe. This made the youth quite angry. If nothing exists, inquired Dokuan, where did this anger come from? Circumflex. In a world often lost in digital illusion and theoretical debates, this tale underscores the significance of grounding philosophical insights in everyday reality. Yamaoka Teshu's encounter with Dokuan reveals a critical lesson.
intellectual understanding and verbal expression of profound concepts like emptiness or non-duality must be integrated with actual experience. Dokuan's unexpected response to Yamaoka's declarations through the physical act of striking him serves as a stark reminder that theoretical knowledge alone is insufficient. Life, in its most basic form, is felt and experienced directly, beyond the confines of intellectual discourse. This story, therefore, highlights the importance of not merely understanding life's principles in theory, but living them genuinely and responsively in the complexities of modern existence. It reminds us that enlightenment or any profound realization is as much about engaging with the world in its tangible, often unpredictable reality as it is about achieving a state of inner understanding or peace. 83. No work, no food. Hyakujo, the Chinese Zen master, used to labor with his pupils even at the age of 80, trimming the gardens, cleaning the grounds, and pruning the trees. The pupils felt sorry to see the old teacher working so hard, but they knew he would not listen to their advice to stop, so they hid away his tools. That day, the master did not eat. The next day, he did not eat, nor the next. He may be angry because we have hidden his tools, the pupils surmised. We had better put them back. The day they did, the teacher worked and ate the same as before. In the evening, he instructed them, no work, no food. In a modern world often detached from physical labor, the story of Hyakujo, an 80-year-old Zen master, embodies the timeless principle of no work, no food. This adage highlights the intrinsic value of work, not just for sustenance, but as a fundamental aspect of human dignity and fulfillment. By laboring in the gardens, Hyakujo exemplifies that work, regardless of age, is essential for maintaining balance in life. His actions teach us the importance of contributing to our communities and the environment, reinforcing the idea that meaningful work is a cornerstone of physical and mental well-being. In an era where digital distractions can lead to disconnection from the physical world, Hyakujo's lesson underscores the significance of staying engaged with tangible, productive activities that nourish both body and soul. 84. True Friends A long time ago in China there were two friends, one who played the harp skillfully and one who listened skillfully. When the one played or sang about a mountain, the other would say, I can see the mountain before us. When the one played about water, the listener would exclaim, Here is the running stream. But the listener fell sick and died. The first friend cut the strings of his harp and never played again. Since that time, the cutting of harp strings has always been a sign of intimate friendship, circumflex. In ancient China, two friends shared a unique bond through music. One played the harp with deep emotion, while the other listened with such understanding that he could visualize the scenes being described through music. Their connection was so profound that when the listener died, the musician, unable to bear the loss, ceased playing, symbolizing the end of their shared experiences. This story illustrates the depth of true friendship, where understanding and empathy transcend words. In today's fast-paced world, it reminds us of the importance of deep, meaningful connections that enrich our lives, encouraging us to cherish and nurture our relationships with the same depth and sincerity. 85. Time to Die Ikyu, the Zen master, was very clever even as a boy. His teacher had a precious teacup, a rare antique. Ikyu happened to break this cup and was greatly perplexed. Hearing the footsteps of his teacher, he held the pieces of the cup behind him. When the master appeared, Ikyu asked, Why do people have to die? This is natural, explained the older man. Everything has to die and has just so long to live. 
EQ, producing the shattered cup, added, it was time for your cup to die. Circumflex. Embracing change and impermanence is vital in our fast-paced world. EQ's story teaches acceptance of life's inevitable ends and beginnings. It encourages us to appreciate moments and objects without clinging, understanding that loss and transformation are natural parts of existence. This wisdom helps us navigate modern challenges with grace and resilience. This story underscores the Buddhist concept of impermanence, which is highly relevant today. In an era of rapid technological advancements and constant change, it reminds us to stay grounded and mindful of the transient nature of all things. By accepting that everything has its time to exist and to end, we learn to value the present and approach life's transitions with a sense of peace rather than resistance. 86. The Living Buddha and the Tub Maker Zen masters give personal guidance in a secluded room. No one enters while teacher and pupil are together. Mokurai, the Zen master of Kenan Temple in Kyoto, used to enjoy talking with merchants and newspapermen as well as with his pupils. A certain tub maker was almost illiterate. He would ask foolish questions of Mokurai, have tea, and then go away. One day, while the tub maker was there, Mokurai wished to give personal guidance to a disciple, so he asked the tub maker to wait in another room. I understand you are a living Buddha, the man protested. Even the stone Buddhas in the temple never refuse the numerous persons who come together before them. Why then should I be excluded? Makurai had to go outside to see his disciple, Circumflex. In a world teeming with distractions, this story underscores the essence of focus and the value of undivided attention. Mokurai's interaction with the tub maker and his disciple highlights the importance of dedicating time and space for deep, personal guidance, away from the hustle of everyday life. It teaches us that in the modern era of constant connectivity, finding moments of solitude and dedicated mentorship can lead to profound learning and personal growth. Just as Mokurai valued the secluded guidance sessions, we too can benefit from creating spaces in our lives for focused learning and reflection, undisturbed by the external noise of the world. 87. Three Kinds of Disciples A Zen master named Gitan lived in the latter part of the Tokugawa era. He used to say, There are three kinds of disciples, those who impart Zen to others, those who maintain the temples and shrines, and then there are the rice bags and the clothes hangers. Gassen expressed the same idea. When he was studying under Tekesui, his teacher was very severe. Sometimes he even beat him. Other pupils would not stand this kind of teaching and quit. Gassen remained, saying, A poor disciple utilizes a teacher's influence. A fair disciple admires a teacher's kindness. A good disciple grows strong under a teacher's discipline. Circumflex In a world bustling with distractions and self-focus, Zen masters Getan and Gaysun teach valuable lessons. Their stories illuminate the varied roles individuals assume in society, educators, supporters, or passive participants. Moreover, Gasson's journey emphasizes resilience, humility, and openness to challenges as essential for personal growth. These narratives prompt reflection on our societal roles and personal development strategies, championing a balanced life that values teaching, community support, and personal perseverance equally. This philosophy underscores the significance of diverse societal contributions and the strength found in overcoming obstacles, offering guidance for navigating modern life's complexities. 88. How to Write a Chinese Poem A well-known Japanese poet was asked how to compose a Chinese poem. The usual Chinese poem is four lines, he explains. The first line contains the initial phase. The second line, the continuation of that phase. 
The third line turns from this subject and begins a new one, and the fourth line brings the first three lines together. A popular Japanese song illustrates this. Two daughters of a silk merchant live in Kyoto. The elder is 20, the younger 18. A soldier may kill with his sword, but these girls slay men with their eyes. Circumflex. In a modern context, this lesson highlights the power of structure and perspective in conveying complex ideas succinctly. It emphasizes the art of transition and the skill of integrating diverse elements into a cohesive whole. Whether in poetry, storytelling, or problem-solving, the ability to navigate between different phases, adapt, and then unify distinct concepts is invaluable. This approach fosters creativity and insight, encouraging us to look beyond the surface and appreciate the depth of connections that can be made when we blend tradition with innovation. It serves as a reminder that in our fast-paced world, taking the time to craft our thoughts carefully can lead to more profound and impactful expressions. 89. Zen Dialogue Zen teachers trained their young pupils to express themselves. Two Zen temples each had a child protege. One child, going to obtain vegetables each morning, would meet the other on the way. Where are you going? asked the one. I am going wherever my feet go, the other responded. This reply puzzled the first child who went to his teacher for help. Tomorrow morning, the teacher told him, when you meet that little fellow, ask him the same question. He will give you the same answer. And then you ask him, Suppose you have no feet, then where are you going? That will fix him. The children met again the following morning. Where are you going? asked the first child. I'm going wherever the wind blows, answered the other. This again nonplussed the youngster who took his defeat to his teacher. Ask him where he is going if there is no wind, suggested the teacher. The next day, the children met a third time. Where are you going? asked the first child. I'm going to the market to buy vegetables, the other replied. Circumflex. In this parable, the interactions between the children and their Zen teachers illustrate the concept of living in the moment and adaptability. The first child seeks concrete answers, while the second embodies the Zen principle of flowing with life's circumstances. Initially, the second child's answers reflect a detachment from fixed plans, suggesting a deep connection to the present moment and an acceptance of where life leads. However, when pressed for a practical response, the child adapts and provides a straightforward answer. This story highlights the balance between embracing the fluidity of life and recognizing when practicality is necessary. In modern life, this teaches us to remain open and adaptable to changes, yet understand when to engage with the world in straightforward, practical terms. 90. The Last Rap Tangan had studied with Singai since childhood. When he was 20, he wanted to leave his teacher and visit others for comparative study, but Singai would not permit this. Every time Tangan suggested it, Singai would give him a rap on the head. Finally, Tangan asked an elder brother to coax permission from Singai. This the brother did, and then reported to Tangan, It is arranged. I have fixed it for you. Start your pilgrimage at once. Tangan went to Singai to thank him for his permission. The master answered by giving him another rap. When Tangan related this to his elder brother, the other said, What is the matter? Singai has no business giving permission and then changing his mind. I will tell him so. And off he went to see the teacher. I did not cancel my permission, said Singai. I just wish to give him one last smack over the head, for when he returns he will be enlightened and I will not be able to reprimand him again. Circumflex in this tale, Sengai's final rap symbolizes a poignant farewell, embodying the bittersweet nature of growth and independence. It underscores the modern life lesson that sometimes mentors push us hard not out of spite, but love, preparing us for future challenges. 
The story teaches the value of tough love, the importance of perseverance, and the realization that our struggles are often for our own enlightenment. This narrative reflects on the necessary hardships in the journey of personal and intellectual development, highlighting the significance of embracing challenges for growth. 91. The Taste of Banzo's Sword Matajuro Yagyu was the son of a famous swordsman, his father, believing that his son's work was too mediocre to anticipate mastership, disowned him. So Matajuro went to Mount Futara and there found the famous swordsman Banzo. But Banzo confirmed the father's judgment. You wish to learn swordsmanship under my guidance? asked Banzo. You cannot fulfill the requirements. But if I work hard, how many years will it take to become a master? persisted the youth. The rest of your life, replied Banzo. I cannot wait that long, explained Matahuro. I am willing to pass through any hardship if only you will teach me. If I become your devoted servant, how long might it be? Oh, maybe ten years, Banzo relented. My father is getting old and soon I must take care of him, continued Matahuro. If I work far more intensively, how long would it take me? Oh. Maybe thirty years, said Banzo. Why is that? asked Matahuro. First you say ten, and now thirty years. I will undergo any hardship to master this art in the shortest time. Well, said Banzo, in that case you will have to remain with me for seventy years. A man in such a hurry as you are to get results seldom learns quickly. Very well, declared the youth understanding at last that he was being rebuked for impatience. I agree. Matahura was told never to speak of fencing and never to touch a sword. He cooked for his master, washed the dishes, made his bed, cleaned the yard, cared for the garden, all without a word of swordsmanship. Three years passed. Still, Matahuro labored on. Thinking of his future, he was sad. He had not even begun to learn the art to which he had devoted his life. But one day, Banzo crept up behind him and gave him a terrific blow with a wooden sword. The following day, when Matahuro was cooking rice, Banzo again sprang upon him unexpectedly. After that, day and night, Matahuro had to defend himself from unexpected thrusts. Not a moment passed in any day that he did not have to think of the taste of Banzo's sword. He learned so rapidly he brought smiles to the face of his master. Matahuro became the greatest swordsman in the land. Circumflex In a fast-paced modern world, the tale of Matajuro Yagyu imparts a timeless lesson. The pursuit of mastery requires patience, dedication, and a willingness to embrace the journey rather than rushing towards the destination. This story underscores the importance of commitment and the dangers of impatience. It teaches that true skill and understanding develop over time through consistent effort and often through unconventional means. In an age where instant gratification is sought after, Matajuro's journey is a poignant reminder that the most valuable achievements are those for which we are willing to invest time and endure hardships, recognizing that the process itself is integral to mastery. 92. Fire Poker Zen Hakuin used to tell his pupils about an old woman who had a tea shop, praising her understanding of Zen. The pupils refused to believe what he told them and would go to the tea shop to find out for themselves. Whenever the woman saw them coming, she could tell at once whether they had come for tea or to look into her grasp of Zen. In the former case, she would serve them graciously. In the latter, she would beckon the pupils to come behind her screen. The instant they obeyed, she would strike them with a fire poker. Nine out of ten of them could not escape her beating. Circumflex. In a bustling tea shop, an old woman's wisdom blurs the line between the mundane and the profound. Hakuin celebrated her Zen understanding, sparking curiosity among his pupils. Skeptical, they visited, seeking enlightenment in sips of tea or hidden truths. Yet, 
The wise woman discerned their intentions, serving tea or lessons with a fire poker's swift judgment. This tale highlights the essence of genuine pursuit versus superficial inquiry. In our modern lives, it reminds us to seek knowledge sincerely, not as a mere spectacle or out of skepticism, but with respect and openness to the wisdom offered by unexpected teachers. It teaches us the value of authenticity and the importance of approaching life's lessons with genuine curiosity and humility. 93. Storyteller Zen. Encho was a famous storyteller. His tales of love stirred the hearts of his listeners. When he narrated a story of war, it was as if the listeners themselves were in the field of battle. One day, Encho met Yamaoka Teshu, a layman who had almost embraced masterhood of Zen. I understand, said Yamaoka, you are the best storyteller in Outland and that you make people cry or laugh at will. Tell me my favorite story of the Peach Boy. When I was a little tot, I used to sleep beside my mother, and she often related this legend. In the middle of the story, I would fall asleep, tell it to me, just as my mother did. Encho dared not attempt this. He requested time to study. Several months later, he went to Yamaoka and said, Please give me the opportunity to tell you the story. Some other day, answered Yamaoka. Encho was keenly disappointed. He studied further and tried again. Yamaoka rejected him many times. When Encho would start to talk, Yamaoka would stop him, saying, You are not yet like my mother. It took Encho five years to be able to tell Yamaoka the legend, as his mother had told it to him. In this way, Yamaoka imparted Zen to Echo, circumflex. In the tale of Encho and Yamaoka, we learn that mastery demands persistence, humility, and the ability to evoke genuine emotions, much like Zen. It underscores the significance of personalized experiences in storytelling, teaching us the value of patience and dedication in mastering any craft. In today's fast-paced world, this story is a poignant reminder to slow down, appreciate the journey, and strive for authenticity in our pursuits, whether in art, relationships, or personal growth. 94. Midnight Excursion Many pupils were studying meditation under the Zen master Sengai. One of them used to arise at night, climb over the temple wall, and go to town on a pleasure jaunt. Sengai, inspecting the dormitory quarters, found this pupil missing one night and also discovered the high stool he had used to scale the wall. Sengai removed the stool and stood there in its place. When the wanderer returned, not knowing that Sengai was the stool, he put his feet on the master's head and jumped down into the grounds. Discovering what he had done, he was aghast. Sengai said, It is very chilly in the early morning. Do be careful not to catch cold yourself. The pupil never went out at night again. Circumflex. In a world of constant distraction, this Zen tale underscores the importance of mindfulness and personal accountability. Sengai's non-confrontational approach teaches that wisdom and compassion can guide us back on track without harsh judgment. Embracing our missteps as learning opportunities fosters growth and self-awareness, crucial for navigating modern life's complexities. This story reminds us to reflect on our actions and their impacts, encouraging a thoughtful, mindful approach to life's challenges. 95. A Letter to a Dying Man Basui wrote the following letter to one of his disciples who was about to die. The essence of your mind is not born, so it will never die. It is not an existence which is perishable. It is not an emptiness which is a mere void. It has neither color nor form. It enjoys no pleasures and suffers no pains. I know you are very ill. Like a good Zen student, you are facing that sickness squarely. You may not know exactly who is suffering, but question yourself. What is the essence of this mind? Think only of this. You will need no more. Covet nothing. Your end, which is endless, is as a snowflake dissolving in the pure air. Circumflex. 
Basui's letter offers profound insight into the nature of existence and our perception of life and death. The essence of his message lies in understanding that our true self, the essence of our mind, transcends physical existence and thus the constraints of life and death. This perspective encourages us to look beyond the material and ephemeral aspects of life, urging us to focus on the eternal nature of our consciousness. In modern life, where materialism and external success often overshadow inner peace and spiritual fulfillment, Basui's words serve as a reminder to seek deeper understanding and contentment within ourselves. By questioning the nature of our suffering and existence, we are guided towards a path of enlightenment, where the endless cycle of desires and fears no longer binds us. This lesson is particularly resonant in a world that is increasingly fast-paced and disconnected from spiritual pursuits, offering a beacon of hope and tranquility in the face of life's inevitable challenges and transition. 96. A Drop of Water A Zen master named Gizen asked a young student to bring him a pail of water to cool his bath. The student brought the water and, after cooling the bath, threw on to the ground the little that was left over. You dunce! the master scolded him. Why didn't you give the rest of the water to the plants? What right have you to waste even one drop of water in this temple? The young student attained Zen in that instant. He changed his name to Tekisui, which means a drop of water. In a fast-paced modern world, this story reminds us of mindfulness and conservation. A Zen master teaches a student not to waste water, highlighting respect for resources and thoughtful actions. The lesson transcends time, advocating for environmental stewardship and mindful living in today's resource-conscious society. It's a call to value even the smallest contributions we can make towards sustainability and awareness in our daily life. 97 teaching the ultimate. In early times in Japan, bamboo and paper lanterns were used with candles inside. A blind man visiting a friend one night was offered a lantern to carry home with him. I do not need a lantern, he said. Darkness or light is all the same to me. I know you do not need a lantern to find your way, his friend replied. But if you don't have one, someone else may run into you, so you must take it. The blind man started off with the lantern, and before he had walked very far, someone ran squarely into him. Look out where you are going, he exclaimed to the stranger. Can't you see this lantern? Your candle has burned out, brother, replied the stranger. Circumflex. In a world where navigating through darkness can metaphorically represent overcoming challenges, the tale of the blind man and the lantern teaches us the importance of awareness and consideration for others. Even when we believe we do not require guidance or illumination, carrying our lanterns ensures we do not become obstacles or burdens to those around us. This story emphasizes the value of proactive empathy and the interconnectedness of our actions in modern life, reminding us to be mindful of how we move through the world illuminating paths not just for ourselves, but for others as well. 98. Non-Attachment Kitano Jempo, abbot of Aihe Temple, was 92 years old when he passed away in the year 1933. He endeavored his whole life not to be attached to anything. As a wandering mendicant when he was 20, he happened to meet a traveler who smoked tobacco. As they walked together down a mountain road, they stopped under a tree to rest. The traveler offered Kitano a smoke, which he accepted as he was very hungry at the time. How pleasant this smoking is, he commented. The other gave him an extra pipe and tobacco, and they parted. Kitano felt, such pleasant things may disturb meditation. Before this goes too far, I will stop now. So he threw the smoking outfit away. When he was 23 years old, he studied I King, the profoundest doctrine of the universe. It was winter at the time, and he needed some heavy clothes. He wrote his teacher, who lived a hundred miles away, telling him of his need, and gave the letter to a traveler to deliver. 
Almost the whole winter passed and neither answer nor clothes arrived. So Kitano resorted to the prescience of I King, which also teaches the art of divination, to determine whether or not his letter had miscarried. He found that this had been the case. A letter afterwards from his teacher made no mention of clothes. If I perform such accurate determinative work with I King, I may neglect my meditation, felt Kitano. So he gave up this marvelous teaching and never resorted to its powers again. When he was 28, he studied Chinese calligraphy and poetry. He grew so skillful in these arts that his teacher praised him. Kitano mused, If I don't stop now, I'll be a poet, not a Zen teacher. So he never wrote another poem, Circumflex. Kitano Jempo's life teaches the importance of focus and detachment in our modern, distraction-filled world. Embracing simplicity and letting go of attachments can lead to a clearer mind and purpose. This narrative encourages us to evaluate our priorities, resist the temptation of temporary pleasures or distractions, and concentrate on our true goals and self-development. Kitano's deliberate choices remind us that mastery and fulfillment come from dedication to our core passions, rather than spreading ourselves too thin across many pursuits. In an era where multitasking and digital distractions are pervasive, Kitano's example is a powerful reminder to pursue mindfulness and intentionality in our action. 99. Tosui's Vinegar Tosui was the Zen master who left the formalism of temples to live under a bridge with beggars. When he was getting very old, a friend helped him to earn his living without begging. He showed Tosui how to collect rice and manufacture vinegar from it, and Tosui did this until he passed away. While Tosui was making vinegar, one of the beggars gave him a picture of the Buddha. Tosui hung it on the wall of his hut and put a sign beside it. The sign read, Mr. Amida Buddha, this little room is quite narrow. I can let you remain as a transient, but don't think I am asking you to be reborn in your paradise. Circumflex. In a world obsessed with status and material success, the story of Tosui teaches us the value of simplicity, humility, and finding purpose beyond societal norms. Living under a bridge with beggars, Tosui embraced a life detached from the formalities and expectations of temple living. His transition to self-sufficiency through making vinegar with the aid of a friend underscores the importance of community and self-reliance. Tosui's interaction with the Buddha's picture, humorously declaring the deity as a transient in his humble dwelling, reflects a profound understanding that spiritual fulfillment and enlightenment cannot be confined to places of worship or idolized in material forms. This lesson is particularly relevant in today's fast-paced, digitally driven society, where the pursuit of wealth, status, and external validation often overshadows the search for inner peace and meaningful connections. Tosui's story encourages us to reconsider our priorities, embrace simplicity, and find joy and purpose in the essence of living rather than in the accumulation of possessions or accolades. 100. The Silent Temple Shoichi was a one-eyed teacher of Zen, sparkling with enlightenment. He taught his disciples in Tofuku Temple. Day and night the whole temple stood in silence. There was no sound at all. Even the reciting of sutras was abolished by the teacher. His pupils had nothing to do but meditate. When the master passed away, an old neighbor heard the ringing of bells and the recitation of sutras. Then she knew Shoichi had gone. Circumflex. Shoichi, a Zen master with profound insight, emphasized silent meditation over traditional rituals at Tofuku Temple, guiding his students towards enlightenment through inner reflection. This approach highlights the power of silence and introspection in a modern world cluttered with noise and distraction, teaching us the value of finding peace and clarity within ourselves amidst the chaos of daily life. 101. Buddha Zen Buddha said, I consider the positions of kings and rulers as that of dust motes, 
I observe treasures of gold and gems as so many bricks and pebbles. I look upon the finest silken robes as tattered rags. I see myriad worlds of the universe as small seeds of fruit and the greatest lake in India as a drop of oil on my foot. I perceive the teachings of the world to be the illusion of magicians. I discern the highest conception of emancipation as a golden brocade in a dream and view the holy path of the illuminated ones as flowers appearing in one's eyes. I see meditation as a pillar of a mountain, nirvana as a nightmare of daytime. I look upon the judgment of right and wrong as the serpentine dance of a dragon and the rise and fall of beliefs as but traces left by the four seasons. Circumflex. In this passage, Buddha conveys a profound perspective on the impermanence and triviality of worldly attachments and desires. By comparing significant human values and material wealth to mundane or fleeting things, he emphasizes the essence of spiritual enlightenment over earthly pursuits. This teaches modern individuals the importance of looking beyond material wealth and societal status encouraging a focus on inner peace, mindfulness, and the pursuit of genuine happiness. It's a call to re-evaluate our priorities in life, reminding us that true fulfillment and contentment come from within, rather than from external achievements or possessions. This wisdom can guide us to lead more meaningful lives centered around compassion, understanding, and a deeper connection with the world around us.